Hello, everyone, and welcome to From the Ground Up podcast. Here we are, our second podcast since the apocalypse. I hope everyone's being safe out there, washing their hands, uh, staying home. I mean, at this point, everyone should be staying home. And also, I just want to mention that, I mean, as other people have mentioned, as reptile people, as a lot of uh, snake breeders, reptile breeders, listen to this podcast a lot of their businesses are affected throughout this whole situation as well as our guest today i'm sure his business is affected as well and so if you can just support the people in the community especially i mean think about the people who went to tinley there they lost thousands of dollars just by not being able to to do that and it's nobody's fault um and then even you know i'm sure there's listeners that may have hourly jobs or jobs in which they were laid off or something like that. So I, I hope everyone's doing okay. Please consider or consider supporting uh, some businesses if you are one of those lucky people who are still working and still has a uh, dependable income. If you were going to buy a snake, I mean, it's, it's probably not a terrible time to do it now. You may really, really help someone out. And uh, with that being said, portcitypythons.com. We have some isopods available, springtails, all that good stuff. Uh, online orders and stuff like that have been kind of weird with the thing. It's like I had a big rush of orders and then all of a sudden kind of dropped off, I think, as people realize it may be a long haul type of a situation. So um, if you were planning on buying isopods or anything, hit me up. And uh, I may do I may do like a discount code or something. and. I don't know. I've I've been trying to think about how I can handle this thing and not be kind of a dick about it. I was going to do 19% off for COVID-19, but I wasn't sure if that was insensitive or not. So anyway, I probably shouldn't have told you guys. I probably should have kept that to myself. I might as well do it now that I told everyone. Um, But today we have on a fellow small business owner. So he actually has two reptiles, uh, pet stores in the Gainesville, Florida area. You may have heard of them, Gator City Reptiles, as well as Hogtown Exotics. So, Chance Chick, welcome to From the Ground Up Podcast. How's it going, man? What up, Joe? I'm glad to be here, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, if you don't mind, can I was just wondering, like, how you're dealing with the whole uh, Corona situation and how that's kind of affecting your business, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah. It's actually it's kind of a kind of a interesting coincidence isn't it that yeah i'm scheduled to be on your show right as the right as the retail apocalypse happens huh yeah uh, (laughs) couldn't couldn't have been better timing um yeah it's 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 crazy at first i wasn't sure exactly what the nature of the impact was going to be you know whether it was going to reach me or not but um honestly we saw it sort of cascade from the bigger cities down towards uh sometimes small town sometimes big town gainesville and uh actually just today just today, we got a mandate from the the governor that all quote unquote non essential businesses have to uh, close down for you know the foreseeable future. And I had to do a lot of rat racing and a lot of article reading and a lot of phone calling to figure out whether I qualified even as an essential business because I was like, hey, you know, I mean, I don't mean to make a case for myself, but I got like thousands and thousands of animals that I have to kind of feed for my customers. You know what I mean? And so like, if this is going to be going on for a month or two months or however long, you know, people's animals have to eat. And I was, I was hoping that I qualified as an essential enough business to at least provide some sort of service for my customers. And luckily enough, I found out today that um, I'm allowed to have one customer per thousand square feet in my building oh, yeah, yeah yeah for the foreseeable future and i have two bit i have two buildings um and they're both like a little over a thousand square feet one's uh 1575 square feet and the other is 1200 on the dot so i can have a whopping one customer <laughs> or one and a half customers per building um so basically we're doing sort of like a we're the dominoes uh carry out of of reptiles and reptile supplies right now so you stop by curbside give us a ring we run your crickets or your super worms or your ball python or your 20 gallon or whatever you need we run it out to you and uh and we'll handle it outside so that there's no uh transmission of the old of the old covid um so yeah but it it is it's been kind of terrifying um and it came at a rough time for me too because like i I just started my first business ever, 26 years old, just started my first business like nine months ago, eight months ago. So I'm like 
getting into the role of like, okay, this is what it's like to be a business owner. And then of course I get the opportunity to get the second store, which is amazing. The stars aligned for me and I couldn't be a luckier person to, to found myself in that situation. Um, and now, you know, what was already a big plate became a bigger plate with the second store. And right as I'm getting to the point where I can sort of digest running two stores at once, uh, pandemic. <laughs> and, and so now I have to, to learn quickly what it's like to run two stores through a, through an apocalypse. So, um, but I'm hanging in there for now. That's it looks like we're hanging in there. Yeah. It's, we're running skeleton crew, but it looks like we're going to be okay for the time being, you know, of course the, the, we're not even through the real mess yet. So we'll see how the next couple of weeks go, but, but we're hanging in there. Do they have mandates of like how many employees you can have in the space as well? Yeah. So I'm not allowed to have uh, more than five, which is awesome because I never have more than five people staffed in a sub 2000 square foot unit. You know, I usually have two to three employees um, on at any given time. And, and unfortunately this is, this is who is, is really suffering for it too, is I'm, I only have the, the payroll support to be able to have one person on at each store during this coming time. So it's basically just going to be one person manning the store. Uh, one of those stores is probably going to be me manning it. So like the real, the real tough part comes from, you know, some of my collegiate employees who, you know, kind of depend on this to, to get their groceries week to week. So I'm, I'm trying to work out some sort of like assistance with them, some sort of like, uh, way to keep them going through this since their hours are going to be kind of cut back, but, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge. That's probably the biggest challenge through all of it. Not, not selling reptiles, but like making sure my, uh, my crew stays, stays tight and stays healthy and stays happy. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, kind of like I mentioned before, I mean, if you're in the area, go check out the store as well as, uh, right now support, <laughs> support your local pet stores, reptile stores, your their businesses online, all the reptile folks out there, consider yeah. supporting them if you can. Yeah, I actually just, um, you know, my my sort of bottom line was only really affected as of like this week is when it started hurting me and I started like really having to assess what we were going to do about all this. And uh, but I've had I have a couple of breeder friends. Gainesville is actually kind of like a weird little epicenter for a lot of reptile people and a lot of reptile breeders like the surrounding area. There's there's some big names like right down the street from me. Um, but they started getting hurt like a month ago or like you know, just under a month ago now, but I've been hearing the woe stories from all my friends who are breeders and online retailers and stuff. And they're like, dude, I haven't had hardly any traffic, hardly any sales, hardly any anything because of this. And so I guess it affected them first. I couldn't really explain it, but I've definitely been listening to them beforehand and, and sympathizing with them. So. Well, as a Kluber guy, I know that uh, I have a lot of people or know a lot of people that produce and then they actually, they export to, to Asia. So I can imagine that that's gotten pretty hairy. If I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. If Harry or stopped altogether, man, Harry would be like the best case scenario in that situation, it seems like. So hopes and prayers for all of them, man. That's, that's, it's tough. It, it really is. And it's definitely not just tough on us it's tough on everybody every industry has been affected and every person's been affected by it you know i'm still i'm still sharing covid19 memes on facebook and stuff too but it's kind of one of those laugh through the pain things you know what yeah. I mean? where it's like haha yeah and then you like look away and you have to cry for a minute because it's actually actually hurting all of us so sometimes laughter is the best medicine though you know yeah i mean there's there's no one at the end of the day there's not going to be probably anyone who's not affected in some way at the very least you're staying in your damn house you know, 24 seven and it sucks a little bit. Yeah. I get to admire my bioactives though a little bit more now that I have to be stuck at home. So there you go. We'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into that later, but let's, uh, let's go back and let's talk about some more fun things. So how'd you initially, Oh, did I lose you? All right. So I lost chance. He'll come back eventually. I'm sure. So anyway, guys, it's been a uh, it's been an interesting couple of weeks here during the apocalypse. I hope everyone's OK. Um, it's kind of funny just seeing everyone's everyone's reactions differently and how everyone was saying it's not a big deal for a little bit. And now it's everyone's going crazy. And I've just been sitting at home doing nothing. Uh, but what I have been able to do is I have been able to pair some Eastern black king snakes because uh, my buddy Mike Kosicki, 
he had mentioned that, hey, uh, pair those things early because for whatever reason, they seem to go early and listen, that the female, I just saw that she was building and I was like, that doesn't make sense. She didn't have her, her post brumation shed yet. How could she be building right now? And uh, well, she was, and she was actually in, sh in blue and I put the mail in and they locked. So, so I think I got it just in time. And uh, well, I don't know about just in time. I don't know if I would have missed it otherwise if I waited until after the shed, but I mean, she was definitely building. So um, I'm pretty pumped about that. Obviously, I, I bred those last year. I did I did get locks from both females, but I did only get eggs from one female. So it doesn't seem, uh, it seems as though they will lock for fun sometimes, even if you are not going to get a clutch. So, and that other female, I don't even know if she even laid slugs, uh, but so I'm not, I'm not counting my, uh, my Eastern black king snakes before they hatch. I also, it also took me six months to get in there. So, oh, Chance is back. Welcome back. Hey, hey. Can what you happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, I, I think the AirPods disconnected because I can't, I'm hearing him over my audio. Sorry, technical difficulties at the house. Yeah, no, you're good. And I've got my tech wizard working on it. <laughs> and by tech wizard i mean significant other i think i'm getting some feedback so i'm guessing your uh, your headphones aren't connected yeah but anyway guys i have uh those eastern black king saints just got just got done feeding and i actually only have one male left i need to contact uh, someone to get the last male and that's that's pretty much that and then i'm going to do the next round of them chance can you hear me yeah, I can now through the AirPods. Can you hear me? Is it clearer? Yeah, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, sorry oh. about that. And I'm glad you had some filler content there because uh, that was unexpected. Sorry. It's not anything that hasn't happened before. So, so we were talking about how you first got interested in reptiles. Oh, man. Oh, jumping, jumping way back. So... Um, I have a story that's similar to most people, I would imagine. Um, I came from a reptile hating family, um, more, more so specifically a snake hating family. You know, every dumb saying you've ever heard, only good snakes, a dead snake, and those cod mouths will chase you. And don't you know that bow will size you up in bed and every myth we've ever heard in this industry. That was my family. Um, and then I, and they weren't even big animal people in general, dogs. But other than that, they had nothing, nothing exotic. Um, so I was definitely a black sheep. Um, I remember my, my mom tells a story um, about how she had what I now know was just an eastern rat snake. Um, but she had a, a snake that she couldn't identify on her porch when I was still in diapers, like a little, little kid. And she killed it, of course, like with a shovel. And she says that when she hit that snake, that I like I was nonverbal at the time. I was still just a baby, but she could say she said that I like winced every time she would hit it. But I, she saw me visibly wince, and I asked her later. Allegedly, it's too I'm too young to or I was too young to remember. But I asked her later, apparently that uh, or why'd you why'd you hit that snake, mom? Like why'd you why'd you do that? Well, justify your actions to me, mother. <laughs> and uh, she was and she said she didn't really have an answer for me that she was scared. And that's all that she could say. And then uh, she knew from then on that I was going to be a reptile lover. And then I was a Steve Irwin acolyte, just like so many of us were. And I was also a Jeff Corwin acolyte and Brady Barr and Austin Stevens and the Crap Brothers and every uh, David Attenborough, every every TV wildlife host naturalist out there. I was. Uh, a little fanboy for you couldn't if i wasn't in front of the tv watching some sort of nature documentary i was at my school's library checking out every single book on animals animals in general but specifically reptiles that i could find um which i think is echoed by a lot of the people who are in the field of like ecology and wildlife biology and stuff that i talk to we all have very very similar backstories i was a dinosaur kid growing up i know a lot of us start off first on dinosaurs and they're like man we can't go catch these maybe i'll switch over to snakes you know um, and then, uh, I decided to turn it into a, uh, a field of study for myself. So when I graduated high school, I started immediately studying zoology with a specialization in herpetology. Um, I started at Santa Fe college here first and I'm on the pipeline to go into UF, but I was about halfway through my bachelor's degree and I was having all my friends who were upperclassmen graduate with their wildlife ecology degrees from UF and they would come back and they'd be like, 
uh, or they and then they get like an internship or a job somewhere, you know, studying dart frogs or studying crown snakes or studying owls or studying, you know, you name it, uh, Eastern Diamondback rattlesnakes. And like, they were like, oh, yes, you know, so excited. And they come back like a year later and they're like, dude, Chance, I've been having the most fun. This is the most interesting thing I've ever done. I love it. I love it. It's everything it was, you know, talked up to be. But can I crash on your couch? You know, like I'm broke. I am out of money and I can't even do the research that I want to do. I can't even do the the conservation work that I want to do because I can barely afford to feed myself um, at the same time. And I was already a product of the, you know, retail pet industry. I had uh, reptiles that I kept. And so I always noticed that there was a disconnect between like the naturalist research community, the people who cared about these animals and the kind of, uh, industry standard pet trade at the time, we'll call it, you know, there's that, there's definitely that, like, they don't always get along, you know, sometimes the, the wildlife conservation people can like look down their nose a little bit at, at captive husbandry. And sometimes captive husbandry is like, oh, you bunch of bleeding hearts, you know, we'll, we'll stick an iguana at a 10 gallon if we want to, you know, that sort of thing. And I think it's so silly that there is that disparity. I'd have never understood why it needs to exist, why the bridge between academia and private husbandry can't be, can't be, or why the gap can't be bridged because it makes so much sense. You know, captive husbandry has done so much for wildlife conservation and wildlife conservation has done so much for captive husbandry. They should go hand in hand. Um, so like my inspiration was basically, I want to be poor. There's these two industries that I am kind of in love with that I think should go hand in hand. So why don't I put a pin in my education? Um, I, scratched and begged and pleaded and rolled over and jumped and you know did backflips for people for like about a year and a half um until i had kind of scraped together the the startup capital to found gator city reptiles and i I launched it with the mission that it was going to be a different kind of pet store it was going to be a pet store with a foundation in wildlife conservation and a foundation in wildlife education more specifically because i modeled myself after all of those wildlife hosts of old that we all grew up loving so my my goal is to you know when a customer comes in not to push a half sale out the door because i don't think they can afford the whole thing but make sure they understand their animal's natural history make sure they understand uh the the climate and the area that they're from and and why this creature is not just something that sits on their desk but a fascinating part of our natural world that should inspire them when they when they see it not just oh man it's cool look at the spikes i want to buy it but like wow, this really is a beautiful spoke in the wheel of life that we live around. So I don't know. It's kind of just a whole mess. No, man, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. So what was, did you grow up in Florida? What was the first animal that you kept? Yeah. Oh, dude, Florida boy that I kept. Yeah. Uh, Eastern rat snake, yellow rat, yellow rat snake. Um, definitely was probably the very, very first one I ever kept uh, with any kind of success. I, you know, as a kid, I didn't know any better. I tried to keep a ring neck snake one time. And when he wouldn't eat from me after like four or five days, I was like, ah, I'm going to kill him. And I just let him go. But, you know, I, I, the first one that I ever kept with any longevity or that I actually had any success with was obviously a, a, a rat snake, a yellow rat. So, and yeah, I had him for years and years and years. Right on. And what kind of, uh, I guess your, your love for the natural environment. I think I lost of... you on your audio. I can't, I, I didn't hear that question. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I can still hear you. Oh no. Damn, now. damn headphones. Take them out. You just disconnect them. <laughs> can everyone else hear me? Do these shut off? Brandy. <laughs> do these airpods like have a battery charge they're full okay well then why aren't they did they disconnect from my phone i can hear you okay you just can't hear me you want to try these oh no, did you have to try these sounds phones? different are you touching them uh-uh. i didn't touch them this man is gonna stop this I broadcast know. i know <laughs> <laughs> no no you're good so as far as the uh, the saga of everything else that's going on, I am just cleaning and feeding, and uh, the animals, none of them have had their post-brumation shed, which seems like it's kind of been a long time, but I have fed them about four times. Um, Chance, can you hear me? Okay, going to go with the no there. So I have fed them about four times or so, and I'm feeding Joe's them pretty much every three to five days. 
and uh and so it's been it's been kind of a slow start to the season but it is kind of interesting timing to to be in my house 24 7 because i get to watch the animals so maybe that'll maybe that'll help my breeding season maybe it'd be a little bit better if it happened during uh during hatchling season because at that point it's just literally feeding babies and everything Joe? like that crap they can hear me <laughs> <laughs> yeah my AirPods are working. I hear all the little chimes and all the little tones that say that it should be working, but your audio is not coming through in the slightest. Can you just so strange? Just disconnect it all together. Um, I'm trying to figure out how I can chat him. All right, I'm trying to talk through this, guys. Should we try to like start the stream over? I don't understand. So I've been trying to just, uh, I've been trying to get the breeding season going. Honestly, I haven't even put my, sorry. Um, unplug the alter, your AirPods. So I've been uh, just, I kind of have the pairings in my head and I know who's going. And I have a bunch of males that may borderline go and i'm not sure if they're gonna go yet because you know they're like one and a half going on two years old they're a little bit small and i just i really want them uh, to go so i haven't had all my projects kind of hammered out yet but i'm excited to see what happens this year this year I'm, honestly i've fed my uh, my females a little bit more than i usually have just because i decided like hey i'm going to produce a bunch this year and then i'm going to probably slim down after um i'm going to keep i'm going to keep a lot of things back so that I can keep some for the future. And then I'm going to slim down some females that uh, they do really well for me, but I just don't see the projects going in the direction That's that good. I need to keep them around. Um, I want to be always refreshing my, uh, <laughs> my breeding stock and whether that is just getting better feeding animals, better uh, meaning like I want all the animals to be feeding like right out of the egg. It's kind of a new thing that I'm trying to, to figure out also like just, bigger naturally bigger animals right out of the egg and stuff like that so i'm, I'm just spending uh or keeping better attention to uh to the breeding stock that i'm keeping back and always no, no, no. always refreshing that and always making sure that it's top notch so uh so that's kind of my method that's going on there yeah i'm not and i also don't want to just produce things for the sake of producing things so well, i'm not connected to anything now either so it should be coming let, i'm just already. going to i'm going to drop him out if you want this person okay so i just kicked him out so he can come back in <laughs> oh no now you can see that the screen isn't full i'm so sorry if this is uh this is the audio version and i didn't and I didn't edit this. I'm really, really busy right now with my day job, since it's uh, since we have a couple retail stores. The the retail stores are closed and all sales are going through the website, and I'm I help manage the website, so it's kind of been super busy on that end for me. And then it's also been like, hey, how the hell do I keep uh, Port City Pythons alive while while all this is going on as well? So I've been trying to. Uh, I've been just pulling double time at the very least lately. But then again, I mean, what else am I supposed to do besides pair animals? So, and then when, of course, like I mentioned before, I'm feeding them so much, getting them ready for the breeding season. It's like uh, they go to the bathroom <laughs> much more as well. So that that's part of the fun too. And I got some mice down in the basement going, and they're starting to to reproduce. But that's fine because I have a whole bunch of holdbacks that uh, will gobble up some pinkies. But I actually need to refresh in my uh, <clears throat> my colony. I feel like I've had the same mice for like a year and a half and two years, and they really don't live that long. So I feel like they're getting kind of old, and I got to uh, I got to keep up some youngins. But I've been I've been doing pretty bad. Um, so Ryan Cox asks, what's the duration between feeds? So it's three to five days. At the, at the very beginning, I was going three pretty religiously. Now I'm going five. Um, honestly, they look, most of the females look about as good as I want them to look right now. Uh, I don't really need to, to power feed them that much, um, but I am still doing a, a good amount just to get this, uh, just to get them going right after brumation. So, and uh, they haven't started pairing yet. 
So I'm just trying to get as much weight on it before that happens. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm feeding, uh, I'm feeding large mice. I'm not going to, to small rats or anything like that. So they're not, I definitely don't want the, uh, the females to get, to get, uh, to get fat. But then again, I don't want that. I want them to have enough body weight to, uh, sorry, I'm talking to chance. I want them to have enough body weight to, uh, to get through the breeding season without any problem. I want them to lay eggs and, you know, not look all withered and have their spine, uh, it's poking out and all that good stuff or bad stuff rather. So yeah, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of how that goes. And then once they do have their post brumation shed, that is when the, uh, that is when the pairing starts and they may not pair exactly. Uh, some of my, it seems that more of my veteran breeders, some females that have been around the block a few times, I guess, uh, I guess you could say they actually get going sooner. So they will, they will eat like, or they may, they may pair up right after that post brumation shed, but, but most do not. Chance, can you hear me? I can hear you now, but I don't have my headphones in. Is the audio quality really bad for you? No, it's fine. I'm not really getting any feedback, which I was afraid of, but yes, yeah, seems fine. Okay. Well, uh, if at any point you get a little <laughs> feedback, let me know and I'll, I'll try to do this again. Was it, Anything but was it on my equipment? I couldn't tell what was going on. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, are, you using, are you using a phone? Yeah, I'm using my iPhone. I don't know. Maybe it's a AirPods thing or whatever the hell they're called. But I, I think people have used those before. Yeah. No, it's weird because your audio – or I couldn't hear anything you said. But even when I disconnected the AirPods, I still couldn't hear anything you said. And I figured once I disconnected them, if the audio was good, you'd at least start coming through like you are now. But we figured it out, I guess. We'll just go yeah. this way until it messes up. This will do. Yeah. Where were we? I'm sorry about all these technical difficulties. No, no, you're good. So we were talking a little bit about the uh, the first reptiles you kept and everything like that, and eastern eastern rat snakes. But when did you kind of bring it to the next level? And I know you're into all this bioactive stuff now. Oh, it was a slow burn, I guess, because uh, I was only allowed. I was on a strict one reptile at a time policy when I lived with my parents. Uh, it was one reptile at a time if I could convince them of that. I think there was like a notable like two or three occasions in my young life where I was allowed to keep more than one. And it was just circumstance. Like I had a cousin who knew I loved reptiles and she dropped off a giant Madagascan day gecko and a toke gecko uh, for me to take care of. And I guess my mom was, you know, feeling soft that day. And she was like, all right, I guess you can take care of both of these, whatever. Only cause they came in together. But um, um, I actually kind of, uh, I fell out of keeping personally after I left the house for a little bit. Uh, like my freshman year of college, I was obviously studying. I was, it was in gen ed, but I was still. Yeah, you, you were studying. I mean, you know, <laughs> we know how freshman year of college is. <laughs> I'm really yeah, glad you... I didn't. I'm really glad I didn't have any animals at the time and they probably would have gotten neglected uh, through no fault of my own. I'd have been too busy uh, doing freshman college things. Um, but yeah, no, I was, uh, I was, I was still, but I was still enrolled in the classes that were like relevant and plus my gen ed classes, but I just wasn't keeping anything. And then one day, uh, I went into my local pet store, um, that I now own shockingly enough, the weird how the world works. Um, I walked into that very pet store and I saw a jungle carpet Python and I had, it's always been one of my dream snakes, Morelia in general are, are amazing. Um, and I held it and it was like the size of a pencil at the time, just a little tiny thing. And it didn't bite. Not one time did it bite me. And I said, well, I'll be damned a jungle carpet python that doesn't bite as a baby. Sign me up. Let me take it home. I uh, hope it eats. And uh, sure enough, she did. Um, and it's kind of been downhill ever since. I was actually, I had a moment with myself there in the store. I was like, man, if only I could get this. And I was like, wait a minute. I live on my own now. I'm a grown ass man. I can do what I want to do. I'm going to buy this snake same day. And I did. And of course I had an old exoterra enclosure that, that was all ready to be, to have some stuff thrown in it. And then, uh, that was, um, God, six years ago, six or seven now years ago, something like that. Six years ago, I think. So five and a half. Oh, okay. My, my, uh, <laughs> my tech wizard and, uh, 
you know, bookkeeper over there says <laughs> five and a half years ago. So, okay. And now I'm up to, oh, what, what are we up to? 68 animals in the house now. So from, from that one Python has spawned this plus all the ones I have at the store. So you guys actually have a number. Uh, it's, it's a real rough number. It kind of goes up and down. She's 68 as our last head count, which was like last week. So it's probably not accurate again. <laughs> how do you, how do you manage between like all the, I mean, I'm sure you have animals coming in for the store, animals going into your collection, all that stuff. Oh, it's, we've really tried to tone down the collection lately just because of the stores. Um, we actually, we downsized quite a bit. I, I opened the store, my very first store that, that I opened and did not purchase. Um, I opened that store with like a lot of my personal animals, which, you know, I, I, and they kind of, a lot of them that I had accrued over the months leading up were sort of planned to be in the store, but you know, they were just my personal animals that I was taking care of for months up until the, the doors opened. And then I, I stocked the shelves with some of my, some of my bearded dragons and ball pythons and things like that. Um, various other things. I had a clutch of baby sulcata tortoises and stuff like that, that I, that I threw in there. Um, but we really have kind of toned the personal collection down to just like things we want to do breeding projects with, things that we're absolutely in love with, you know, dream species sort of things. And then everything else kind of goes to the store. Um, we have a couple of display animals that are like personal animals in the store that are certainly not for sale. Uh, I have a black-headed python named Irwin. I have a adolescent rhino iguana. I've got a little alligator. I've got a little spectacle caiman now. Uh, we have a big caiman lizard. We got some some neat stuff in there that's that's just display animals. But um, as far as the managing goes, man, it's that's been like one of our biggest personal challenges between me and my significant other, which I am lucky enough to have a partner in crime and all this. She is the terrier when to my Steve Irwin, I say all the time. Um, and she actually is an animal care specialist. She was a vet tech uh, for a number of years. And then she decided, you know, I'm done with dealing with moron customers who don't want to get the vaccines for their dogs and stuff. Not that, you know, I, I know that some people have issues with their vets that may be ground, like, you know, uh, warranted, but she, she used to tell me some horror stories about people who didn't want to do proper treatment for their animals and stuff. And so now she's an animal care specialist actually out at a reptile facility. And so her and I kind of tag team it. She does a lot of the heavy lifting at home, uh, just because I'm so busy between the two stores, but, uh, we, together we get it done. So that's kind of how we manage. Awesome. So as far as the, the stores go, I mean, I think that's kind of a lot of people's dreams that are probably listening to this, especially, I mean, as a childhood dream, so many of us grew up going to pet stores. How does one, especially someone, I mean, honestly, as young as you, how do you get started and, and open your own store? Wow. That's a, that's a question. Um, I honestly don't even like the, the process is, is so so long and so storied now it feels like a different lifetime getting this thing going it was it was honestly such a uh you gotta want it you gotta want it really 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 bad and on top of wanting it as bad as you wanted anything you have to have a support network you can't do it alone i learned that uh at first sort of the hard way but you really cannot do it alone you got to have your people with you and you have to lean on them that's the biggest trick i've always had people in my corner which is awesome but sometimes i wouldn't ask of them and I wouldn't lean on them when I needed to. And honestly, that was the biggest, one of the biggest things was having those people there to support me. And I have, and I find I'm, I'm rich in nothing. I'm rich in friends, you know, if, if nothing else, because they really have, uh, have banded together to, to support me. And, um, and that capital investment, man, that's a, that's a bitch to drum up. That is a bitch to get Uh small business loan, uh, angel investment, you know, counting your pennies, bartending, whatever you can do. You got to scrimp and save every single dime that you possibly can. I, uh, I know the number gets probably lost in translation a lot, but, uh, I think that the startup cost for a brick and mortar retail space for like uh, between a thousand and fifteen hundred square feet, you're looking at no less than like one hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars, you know, at the very least, which is can take. I mean, it took me years. I was uh, through college. I bartended. I did security for a number of years in the bar industry, and then I bartended for a number of years. And luckily, that's a fluid enough industry that you can sort of pay your bills and set aside a little piggy bank, um, and just years and years of that on top of some uh, some convincing uh, for some angel <laughs> investors uh led me to and a little bit of debt a lot of debt actually uh led leads you there so 
and work, dude. I've never filed so much paperwork and moved so many cages and and uh, met so many people about so many different contracts in my entire life, man. It is it is a slog. But when you get to stand back and you get to look at that big marquee sign above your store and you get to see your customers come in and leave with smiling faces and you get to stand in your store and teach people about animals, which is all I've ever wanted to do, it makes it all worth it. Dude, like how do you – how do you deal with all that pressure as far as, you know, having to get all these things done, you're using other people's money, you're using your whole life savings, you're in debt, all this shit. How do you make sure that this store is like perfect and ready to (laughs) go? Is it ever perfect? Um, It's, I, it's, 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 yeah, yeah. It's from the moment I get up in the morning, basically, you know, I, uh, I've always had a way with, what's up? Oh, him, the little melanist. He's at the, he's at the window. Um, I've always kind of had a way with getting people to see my vision. Uh, it's always been a blessing of mine. So if, if I can get someone to sit down and interface with me, I've always been talented, I guess, or gifted or whatever you want to call it with being able to articulate my vision to them and then get on board. Um, so that's a huge, a huge benefit when I have to meet all these people and I have to convince everyone and I have to, you know, word all these contracts, my leases and things like that. Uh, you know, being, getting one-on-one with people, I think has been one of my strongest suits as far as like make sure, making sure everything stays perfect, including the people who, you know, gave me my startup capital, you know, how being able to being transparent with them, but also convincing, you know, where you're like, yes, here's the honest truth, but here it is framed in such a way that you realize what a good idea this is and what a good investment this is and how awesome this is going to be. So that's a, that's a huge factor for it. And I mean, I, tell me if this is too personal, but I mean, cause I think people would be interested. Like who do, you, who do you, who do you look for in someone who may be willing to give you money in like an investor? Um, Ooh, someone rich and bored. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. um, no, actually a, a huge, 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 huge chunk of it for me with the, with the first store and with the second store actually was uh, a family member, which was really, really helpful. My, uh, my grandmother, she's, she is 87 years old. Uh, she is recovering right now through this pandemic. She's recovering through hip surgery, full hip replacement. Uh, she's about four foot, eight inches tall and has all of the piss and vinegar of a six foot four bodybuilder. You know, she's, she's, <laughs> she's a lively one. And uh, I spent a long time sort of kind of getting her on board with the idea and, and convincing her to. And so she, she finally one day was like, okay, this is your dream. I'm going to help you achieve your dream. And so she, and I, and it's not like it was for free. I still owe her. I'm still on a monthly <laughs> payment plan with her, just like I am every other uh, debtor. But um but she, you know, the interest rate isn't super bad with her, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> she was, she was a, a huge portion of it. And that goes back to the support network thing too, man. It would have been, it had been another five years before I could open this place. If I had to scrape together a bunch of other investors on top of, you know, the other ones I did. So it's a. Hell yeah. Shout out to grandma. Yeah. She's the best man. I don't know what I'd do without her. So, so Darren asked an interesting question in the chat and he asked uh, how you go about educating uh, first time customers that come into the store. Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, it kind of, it comes down to, you got to gauge them in the first like five seconds of talking to them. You know, you really have to gauge how you're going to approach this because there are people who come in with a little bit of background, you know, and, and I don't necessarily mean reptile people. I mean, people who with a background of like what it's like to keep an animal alive or what it's like to work with animals in general, you know, you get those people and they're a lot easier to sort of like broach the topic with right away because you can use certain terminology that you, you know, you're free to use your verbiage the way you want. You're free to describe things a certain way. Um, But then you get those people who can be a little like uh, bullheaded for lack of a better term. You know, they come in, they're like, I want a turtle. I want a little green turtle. I want a little green turtle that stays this big and I want to put it in a 10 gallon tank and I want it to stay there forever. And you kind of have to explain very, you know, you have to take them back a couple steps and you go, well, turtles are amazing pets, but they are a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of upkeep and a lot of care, especially by reptile standards, you know, filters and tanks and they grow and et cetera, et cetera. And I could go on and on. Um, and so you have to just, uh, you have to take measured steps towards not overwhelming them, not running them off because it's not just about losing a customer. It's if I run you off because I'm abrasive or I run you off because I rubbed you the wrong way or I threw too much at you at once, I also lost that opportunity to educate you. 
you know, I, I could be damned with the sale. I didn't start this because I wanted to make a trillion dollars. I wanted to pay my bills and educate people. So it's more important that I sort of get you interested in learning on your own rather than try to cram knowledge down your throat and do it abrasively. Um, so if I can inspire someone to then come back and ask me questions, like if I just drop a little hint, plant a little seed of something, a factoid or something like that, or, or lean them in that direction. And then even if it's a full conversation later, if they come back and they go, you know, I was actually really interested. Tell me more about, you know, this species or, or this setup or this certain thing, you know, that's a victory. And then I can sort of start to elaborate more for them because I got to do something with all this knowledge I've accrued over the years. <laughs> there you go. And what do you think people come for? Or what have you seen people come for as far as uh, getting their first animal? What's, what's the most popular first pet snake or reptile in general? Um, I'd say the most popular is definitely ball python. Uh, I am like, I am firmly of the opinion that there are two industries in this, in this industry. There is the ball python industry and the reptile industry. And they are not necessarily the same thing. You know, they, the ball python industry is its own entity. Um, and it is uh, forever and irrevocably linked to the reptile industry, like the, the brick and mortar pet trade. Like it is a huge, huge, huge facet, whether you like it or not, whether you're a ball, pi ball python person or not. Uh, but it's definitely the the snake people come in for the most and it's the first it's the best starter snake for for most people um for a lot of reasons they're popular for a reason in the pet trade so um oh thank you mike i appreciate that man yeah actually uh i just met mike not too long ago he does have two of my animals he's a good dude yeah i'm just gonna put up some people because people are saying nice things to you so i'll put them up uh, oh jeez <laughs> in a while i'm flattered awesome cool Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously you're doing a great job with, with the pet store, but how did you, what was your vision as far as, uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways, I guess you can do a pet store, meaning like if you, if you look at most pet stores out there, they're making money off of dog food, right? Um, yeah. how exactly does one set up, you know, a reptile specific one? And then like, did you have a vision of you were going to keep certain animals over others or? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that, absolutely. Um, so, no matter which way you, you paint it, um, a reptile store's bread and butter is feeders and dry goods. There's no way around it. You know, um, actually the previous owner of the store that I bought out had a really, really good, uh, a saying, um, he was like, I'm a, I'm a feeder store. I sell rats and crickets. That's what I do. And then, you know, everything else is just gravy or, or, you know, a side piece or, you know, it's, it's an interesting factoid beyond what I do, but I sell feeders and crickets or feeders and rats, rats and crickets. Um, and he's, and he's not wrong. That is always going to be your bread and butter that and like substrate and things like that. But, uh, the animal sales are kind of the, the, the highlight. They're the star of the show. They're the thing that people are obviously interested in. And of course there was a list of animals I did want to keep some of which was realistic, some of which wasn't some of which still is realistic, but it's planned for the future. Um, and then there was a list of animals that I kind of wanted to like, not necessarily not keep, but dial back on until I could take a stab at making sure people kept them the right way. Uh, things like hermit crabs, you know, I mean, like they're a really cheap, easy to acquire animal, but no one keeps them the right way. Things like baby turtles. Baby turtles are a huge example of something that everyone tries to keep and nobody keeps the right way. Not nobody, but most people. Um, water dragons. Chinese water dragons was a huge one for me too. I was so sick of walking into uh unspecified corporate locations and seeing you know just tragic poor little water dragons that go home and die a week later they're one of the more maligned species out there so um so yeah big education on some of those less than represented species was a huge uh driving point for my store too and if you walk into any one of my stores you may see some of those species but you'll see them cared for the way they're supposed to be cared for and you will get the knowledge before you walk out the door that's a huge 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 thing for us we do not let someone walk out the door unless we know that they're comfortable with that animal and that that animal is going to be comfortable with them. I study them. I love them more than I love people. So I got to make sure they're okay <laughs> when they're on their way out the door. So. Right on. And how is, uh, I mean, one, one of those pets is usually uh, the green iguana. What is going on there in Florida and kind of what's the status of, uh, are you able to sell them? I haven't really been paying much attention well, lately so to be honest. The last I heard the update was that basically with the whole green iguana and tegu thing, they are going to be now a conditional species. But with them 
coming into the conditional species list, they're taking that opportunity to reform what a conditional species is in Florida and what you can do with conditional species. So it really, more than iguana and tegu people, it's really going to hurt my retic friends and my berm friends and people who work with big conditional species because they're basically trying to make it where you can't uh, breed them like at all. Uh, you can keep them for educational purposes still, or like display and stuff like that, but you cannot breed for profit anymore. Even if you're selling out of state, um, I believe you still will be able to sell out of state last time I read it. And if this is all I believe, of course, I'm a human, I could make mistakes, but the last, the way I interpreted it was you can still sell out of state, but you can't breed. So it's only like wild caught things here in the state, iguanas, tegus, uh, berms, as long as they're not on ENP, whatever, you know, that sort of thing. Um, that's my understanding of it. Of course, FWC also hasn't made a ruling on the way that they're going to enforce those rules. Right now, it's just a state statute. So the state said, hey, this is what we want. FWC, figure out how we're going to do that. So it's we're still kind of up in the air. It'll be a few months before we have any real legislation. But it's looking like they're going to try. Are you steering clear of those species at the moment? or? Um, I actually have a couple in stock. Uh, that were like that I just had incidentally. Um, that, you know, I don't go out of my way to purchase green iguanas anyway because they're another one of those lovely species that everyone thinks they want and then they don't realize how difficult and uh, challenging a green iguana can be to keep. Um, Tegus kind of sucks because they're like honestly, if you have the experience, if you're ready for an intermediate to advanced keeping lizard, you know, Tegus are a great choice, man. They don't get too big, but they do get impressively large and they have great demeanors if they're worked with and, and raised the right way. So like that one kind of does suck because I think they're a fantastic lizard in the captive pet trade if you do it right. Uh, but iguanas, it's that's one of those ones I already kind of steered away from. Um, I have some. They're incidental. I will be still looking for good homes for them, but I'm certainly not going to push them out the door just because this is coming down the line because I already didn't. I steer more people away from green iguanas than almost anything else besides turtles. <laughs> so... I yeah, might be stuck sure. with them. I might have to get. I might have to get my conditional and build an outdoor enclosure. So we'll see. <laughs> I guess that is that is the nice uh, thing about Florida, huh? Yeah, I mean, I live. Uh, I live. There's definitely like some freezes we get every year, but as long as I do some like you know, some hot boxes with radiant heat panels, or I have some indoor enclosures ready for them, I can I can battle the cold up here, and then the rest of the year is is yeah peachy for them. It's perfect. So. Do you ever suggest, I mean, people keep things like turtles outside? I mean, is that something that's reasonable? Only if it's a native species down here or one that's like equally equatorial, uh, so to speak. You know, if, if it's a species that lies in the same uh, climate that Florida does, I have a little gnat in here that's absolutely driving me crazy. Um, if it's a turtle that's native or lies in the same kind of climate that Florida experiences, it's not like a huge, huge deal. Obviously, make sure it's big enough that a bird of prey is not going to come swoop in and and pick it up or a raccoon or something like that. But if you've got a good enclosure and it's appropriate for that biome, then it's not the, it's not the worst thing in the world. A lot of native species do really well. I have five uh, yellow bellied sliders out in a uh, enclosure right now, uh, outdoor enclosure, and they can stay in there year round, even through, as long as you keep like three feet of water and some mud in the bottom, you know, they're, they're pretty solid for, for, you know, um, regulating themselves even through the winter. So I've never had any issues, never run into any personally. I'm probably going to get flamed by some turtle keeper now because I said that, but I've never run into any issues. But I am always open to criticism too. If someone comes to me and says, hey, that husbandry practice is completely inappropriate. Where did you learn that? I go, I don't remember where I learned that. Please teach me the way I'm supposed to do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what is, uh, as far as keeping inside, I mean, behind you, you have this giant enclosure that looks to be planted and Yep, I actually, just, I actually just set this little dude up. It's a little Varanus Malinus, a uh, little quince monitor for those who are unfamiliar. And he is a, I can't seem to target him. He is an absolute dream and I absolutely love him. And he is a personal animal. Um, we have a couple of enclosures in here that are pretty good size. This one's, I believe, five feet by two and a half or three feet deep and then like four feet tall. Um, and then that's the second biggest indoor enclosure we have. I have an eight foot by four foot by four foot on a two foot stand in the living room that houses three Spilotes pilatus, uh, tiger rat snakes. Um, Sweet. Yeah, yeah. So we do. We have some serious indoor enclosures, uh, much to my love's uh, chagrin. She doesn't exactly like having to deal with all those enclosures all the time, but some of them are really pretty. We have most. Doing the yeah, the bioactives, of course, are the most uh, 
the most fun of any of them and it's it's our passion too i'm, I'm a huge bioactive guy and like in this town in this area i'm kind of that guy like most people come to me for that and i wouldn't have it any other way i uh, i don't try to pat myself on the back for much but i do feel like i kind of brought it to gainesville because it was sort of being like talked about and of course people were doing it i'm not going to claim they weren't but like my store had bioactive products before the other store did and then i bought the store and lo and behold when i got over there there was some bioactive products and i was like look at that i'm inspiring people you know I'm bettering the industry already before i even have a chance so so yeah it's uh it's there a whole thing go. yeah so i can you go over a little bit of uh you know maybe some products you have but also some products that you just use or maybe you even take things from outside i mean how does uh how the does one thing, start a bioactive in, enclosure correctly? The only thing I use from outside around here, just because I'm super careful, uh, the only thing I use throughout here is in my leaf litter. Um, I use magnolia leaves and oak leaves, and I always, you know, throw them in a pan and cook them for a half an hour at around 200 degrees, something like that. Um, uh, I use those from outside. I'll use, I'll sometimes treat my own branches too with the same sort of uh, deal. I'll sandblast them or something like that and then cook them, make sure there's nothing else on them and throw them in there. But everything else, I've used Josh's frogs. I love his products. Um, but then I used his products first and then I fell in love with uh, Josh Halter's products, the bio dude. I use him for pretty much everything and I carry him in the store. He's one of my, uh, he's my bioactive line in the store. I'm a, I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of their products. Um, this one was a homebrew, but it's been set up for a really, really long time. I didn't have the bio. I actually purchased this bioactive. I didn't set it up myself. Um, but uh, yeah, a couple of the other, a couple of the other bioactives, um, uh, that I have in, in the house are all, uh, bio dude products. So that's, he's the one I carry. And I think Josh's frogs makes great products too, but I'm just, I really, really, really like bio dude. So he's the one I kind of shill for and push for. Right on. I mean, even when, uh, when you have made your own in the past, I mean, is it basically like an ABG? I mean, what's the, what's the base? Substrate? Oh, I've. I've done a, I've, I've done a lot of different stuff. I've tried like organic topsoils mixed with like peat moss and a little bit of carbon and spag moss and things like that. A little charcoal thrown in there too, which is, which I think is like a lot of the components of ABG anyway, uh, is especially like the, the peat moss and the, and the charcoal and stuff. If I remember correctly, um, I might be wrong there, but I, I usually just try to, and I'll try to like incorporate a little bit more natural sand if it's a more semi-arid or a little bit more heavy on the peat moss if it's a if it's a, a tropical environment that I want to keep a lot of humidity on. But um, I've done a lot of different exper experimenting in the past. Now I kind of am of the opinion that I leave it to the pros. To be honest, dude, the bioactive products, the ratios he uses, uh, the bio dude and stuff, I've they've never steered me wrong. So I kind of am just like, oh, why put in the effort, you know, when I can just <laughs> get his products wholesale and then throw them in my enclosures. Um, yeah, it's easy, easy to do when when you're buying a wholesale for the stores anyway. Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, you know, we need ten bags for the store. All right, eleven bags it is. You know <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, I, I've also run into some challenges too. Like when I try to do homebrew stuff, like I I introduced a uh, scale into one of my my the, my Spilotti's enclosure actually the one in the living room. I introduced scale in that massacred all of my viburnum and my Schaflero were a little bit more resistant to it those are plants obviously for people who uh, i have no idea home. oh sorry a viburnum is, <laughs> a viburnum is like a little shrub it's it's kind of like a garden shrub one you'd see it gets really branchy and tree like it's it's good for climbing for arboreal snakes and then shiflera are um, umbrella plants uh, a lot of people they're one of the more commonly used trees in bioactives if you're going to do something that's going to grow up and be kind of branchy as it gets older um and they got wrecked by scale the chauffeur did a little bit better but the scale came in from something i brought in outside and i guess didn't treat effectively enough and it it massacred all my plants so that kind of sucked so you always run that risk you know if you're if you're going to try to do your own home brews introducing some little uh less than desirable hitchhiker i had some um leaf litter moths recently in my isopods too i opened up my isopod drawer and a bunch of moths flew out and i was like well i didn't put those in there uh, so i don't know where those came from so so it, it well, happens you know, I had I had crow brooches in all mine. So you had what? Yeah, the the guy I originally got got a bunch of cultures from. He also did roaches, and uh, he used to use the isopods to clean up after the roaches. So oh. eventually, I just had roaches starting to show up. Like, oh, fuck <laughs> me. Well, that's extra just extra protein for the isopods, right? 
There you and go. Just, uh, handle them, and then boom, there's some protein. That's funny. Yeah, but as far as uh, you were talking about hitchhikers that you don't want, what are the uh, the cleanup crews that you're putting in your bioactives? Um, so I kind of I lean really heavy on dwarf white tropicals for the most part, as far as the isopods go, and then of course uh, springtails in everything, dry or 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 wet. And um, I've I've kind of dabbled around with like the drier species of springtails. I don't really know the difference species wise. Um, it's not something I'm versed in technically, but I just am like, oh, these, someone tells me that these springtails do better in dry. Okay. I'll throw them in that leopard gecko enclosure. Um, but as far as the isopods go, you know, I, I do a little trial and error with the species, but oftentimes if it's any sort of humidity level, I lean heavy on dwarf white tropicals just because they're such an efficient little cleanup crew. Um, but I have like I have 13 varieties, I think something like that. Uh, got like clowns and zebras and dairy cows and all that fun stuff. And, and dwarf, uh, dwarf purples, dwarf whites, powder blues, powder oranges, all the different varieties under the sun, except rubber duckies, you know, one day when those are a little cheaper, maybe, but right now, no, <laughs> I, uh, I got some a few weeks back. Um, Did I guess I, I didn't really tell anyone, but, uh, Actually, I believe it was it was Mike went in with uh went in with me on him, and nice. so yeah, I've got I've got like twelve of them or something. What it, uh is it is it too prying to ask what you paid per isopod? <laughs> only only because it's someone who I buy from on a regular basis. So yes, but it was it's I'll I'll tell you off air. Okay, fair and enough. That, I can yeah, I can only that's the. Yeah. Fair enough. I can only imagine what you paid, but uh, I'm excited to know. <laughs> I mean, no, it's not cheap. Trust me. It's not <laughs> <fucking cheap. laughs> but, but it was worth it, I think. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. We'll if, you can, if you can breed them, it's absolutely worth it. I don't know, man. It might be a little bit. Fair enough. I, I heard it takes, I mean, I heard it takes a while and people have some trouble with it. So I'm not, uh, I'm glad I have them, but I'm not hopelessly i'm not super optimistic about it but right. I, I have other cuberis and they do the cuberis marina or whatever the hell you call them and they're doing pretty well so okay well, keep these ones as well maybe i'll be i'll be first in line if you do start producing them so you know <laughs> i'll hit you up so when did you when did you first get interested in uh in isopods uh when i got interested in bioactives to be honest with you i didn't i wasn't like man you know what i need tiny crustaceans in my life i was like uh <laughs> I was like, I always, it was, it was kind of a weird fantasy as a kid growing up when I would look at my, you know, snake or lizard or whatever on like eco earth or whatever, some mono monocultured substrate. And, uh, I didn't know any better and I didn't realize there was going to be a thing in the future, but I always used to sit and think like, man, the dirt outside that these animals live on isn't straight cocoa fiber. Like they're not living on straight coconut fiber. There's gotta be a more natural way to do this. And so like, I would try. I guess baby's first bioactive was some of my enclosures when I was growing up. I would like go, I would go outside. I would take a 20 gallon lid and I would go outside and I would shovel dirt onto this lid and I'd put that over a bucket and then I would shimmy the dirt through getting all the clumps out into a bucket. And I, afterwards I would take that dirt and I'd be like, this is dirt. This is nothing but dirt. This is the good <laughs> stuff from outside. My rat snake is gonna, love this and i would keep them on stuff like that because it was my first little before i knew what bioactive was ever going to be i i would try stuff like that but of course i didn't uh it wasn't until much 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 later that i started uh seeing people do it in like aquaculture and things like that and then the first people i you know the first youtube videos i would stumble upon or the first oh i have dart frogs and the best way to do that is with this and then i kind of discovered it when i discovered the term bioactive it was a rabbit hole once I was like, that's it. That's the term that I can attach to this and then do a bunch of research and, you know, the rest is history. And I discovered isopods and decided to get my first batch and was like, oh, these aren't super hard to keep. And then I killed all them. And then, uh, <laughs> but then I, um, yeah, it was, it was all downhill once I'd kind of discovered what bioactivity was as a, as a, as a, I don't want to call it a science, but as a science, you know, when, when that first started becoming an industry thing, I was, I was right on board because it was it was something that i drew from always wanting to do in my enclosures so the so most where do you approach. where do you fall as far as uh you know there's such a big push now for naturalistic bioactive and stuff like that and kind of away from tubs 
I mean, it seems like so, you've always been on what the Mueller bioactive said. Yeah, I uh, so I know a lot of really ethical tub breeders. I really do. Like, I know a lot of guys who I can never knock on their husbandry because their animals are healthy and their animals seem content and their animals eat and breed and behave normally and happily. And I can't, I can't say that I can't look at that animal and be like, no, that animal told me the other day that it's really unhappy. So I, I can never knock people who do tub breeding. Uh, but I think as far as like the casual hobbyist goes and the person who's just keeping a couple animals at home or wants to keep things because they want to keep them in their natural setting, I think bioactive is going to overtake here in the next couple of years. I always look at Europe uh, because they're always like five to 10 years ahead of us in all husbandry practices. <laughs> and I noticed that now over there, unless you've got like a really good excuse, almost everything is bioactive, you know, I mean, unless it's like a huge monitor or something that's really unfeasible to keep bioactive, it's usually bioactive. Um, and so I kind of look at that and I go, you know what, our industry in a few years, we'll see how it goes. And if more people like me start opening businesses who push it every single day, people walk in and they go, oh, what do I need for this animal? And I'm like, here's what you need. Here's the bare bones. But if you want to keep them super naturally, if you want to keep them uh, you know, in the humidity that they like it, and it's, it's so good for them too, just because not just aesthetically, but because like you want to make sure their humidity is on point, replicate their environment to the most natural possible plate way you could, you know, if you, if you get the same soil composition, the same clay, sand, carbon soil composition that they're used to in the wild, you get the same sort of plants that they're used to in the wild. You get the same sort of like rain patterns that they're used to in the wild, that animal is going to have healthier sheds. That animal is going to eat better. That animal is going to feel like it's more, its natural processes are going to take over more because it's being stimulated the exact way its species has been stimulated for, you know, however long. I don't want to offend any, anybody in particular. <laughs> I think it's, it's interesting that people think it's more difficult, but I mean, I just set up just a few enclosures like that. And it's like, once it's good, it's good, man. Absolutely. And that's what I tell people too. It's another selling point, honestly, um, because I, I do have to be a salesman at the end of the day as well. Uh, one of my big selling points with people is they walk in and they're like, ah, it seems like a lot of work. And I'm like, well, it's more like you're putting the cogs together in the right places. It's a more complicated machine in, in that sense. But if you put all the cogs right where they need to be, and then you start that machine turning, that machine runs itself. It's, the, it's like the difference between an automated loom and, and, a, and a hand loom. You know, like it's maybe the automated loom is a little bit more complex in its engineering, but you, as long as it's working, you push that button and it does the job as opposed to you having to hand crank. You're pulling out some 1800s references on it right now. <laughs> hey, well, I, I'm keeping you on your toes, man. I'm well-rounded. I don't know. Respect that. So uh, lighting, uh, I see you have some beautiful lighting on going on. And obviously you're growing plants. So uh, what do you use for lighting? Yeah, so these, uh, the LEDs, I have two, oh man, what did he told me the brand name? So this is one of the ones I purchased. Arcadia? So kind of, no, I don't think they're Arcadia's. He didn't spend that much money on them. I was like, that's, that's the one that everyone loves, right? Oh my gosh, it's the best kind of lighting you can get, dude. If you can get Arcadia's, that is the top brand. I don't even carry them in my store because they're hard to carry. I've been trying to get them in my store forever now. Uh, in my store, honestly, I use the BioDude Grow Lights. Um, he's got the LED ones and he's got the T5 ones. The T5 ones are a little bit cheaper and they obviously do eventually go out. But those LED ones, man, if you want to, if you want to pay the money for it, I've never used a grow light that, that blows my plants up like, like his grow lights do. Um, but Arcadia makes amazing products. Their UVB products are the top of the line too, man. I don't, and I, you know, I'm not shilling cause I don't even carry them in my stores. They just are the best lights. Um, in here, we just have uh, some stock T5 LEDs, and then there's two grow lights of an unspecified brand because, like I said, I bought this one. I didn't actually set it up myself. And then I have a, uh, a Reptisun or a PowerSun. Is it 120 watt? I think I have 120 watt, but I want to upgrade it to 160 because he's a Varanus, so he likes to bask. Even though he is like a tropical, more tropical species, he still likes his basking spot. So. That's what, that's the lighting I've got in here. For a lot of my other ones, I use uh, BioDude Grow Lights because they're the most available to me and they do the job perfectly adequately. Like they, they, they nail it. So I've never run into any, issue, any issues. About how big and what's the pricing on those? Uh, what on, on the, on the BioDude, BioDude Grow Lights? Yeah. Um, he has the T5s in like 12, 24, 36 inch, um, 
varieties and they're little self housed. Like you get the, you get the, uh, the housing and it comes with one bulb. Um, uh, but it's not like a one use throwaway type situation. You know, you just pop that bulb out and order another bulb, or you can use it for a UVB T5. You know, it's a versatile little fixture that you get from him. But, um, uh, they're like, I want to say they're like right off hand, like in the 40 to $65 range, something like that, depending on the size you get. Maybe like the fifty to sixty five dollar range, something along those lines. I gotta remember a lot of different products. It's hard to remember my price point on <laughs> no, all of them. But that's that's just about what they go for, barring someone doing the research and getting more specific on me. Um, I think that's about what they go for. And then his LEDs are are a little bit more expensive. Um, the the big huge ones run into the hundreds, um, and then the smaller ones are usually somewhere in like the sixty dollar or fifty sixty dollar range. Uh, but hey, dude, worth every penny. Uh, you know, I've never bought a light that I've been more pleased with you know i bought plenty of like fancy bulbs that i took home and they went out after two weeks and i was like boy was that a waste of money um yep. but these these grow lights tend to be tend to be really really good so yeah i mean yeah. every every big to be honest every big corporate name brand reptile company that makes lights are not the best mm -mm, no no yeah yeah you won't catch me um well i so the 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 uh the mercury vapors the mercury vapors I'll use just because I somebody send me a link to a to a small company that makes a better one. I would I'd be more than happy to research it. But for now, dude, the uh, the solar glows, the Exoterra solar glows. I'm a big fan of those. And when I can't use those, I use the Reptisuns. I I'm a huge fan of mercury vapor. If you've got some that can stand high basking temperatures, that's like the that's like one of my favorite bulbs to use. Um, honestly, for UVB and heat, uh, it's they're 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 dope. Um, so that's like the only big name bulb I actually like prefer to use myself. Uh, it's just because I don't know about any specialty brand that does it any better. So, yeah. Now, I mean, the the one behind you is obviously handmade, and you bought that one. As far as the enclosure goes, uh, do you have a bunch of other? Are you into building your own enclosures, or do you have uh, you have different type of enclosures? Um, yeah, I build some of my own too. Uh, I had a really, really good friend of mine who's a vet student at UF help me build the uh, Spilotti's enclosure in the living room, which is the same. Oh, uh, he's actually the guy I bought this one from, uh, oddly enough. So they're like the same footprint when you look at them just to a different scale or, or they're the same uh, design, but to a different scale, I guess I should say. Um, but then I've got some that are just in like uh, traditional Exoterras and Zoomed front open enclosures. I've got a couple that are in like traditional, traditional 20 gallons and, and 40 gallons and things like that. Um, and then I, but I do have a couple I've built myself. Like I have a big eight by four out in the uh, outbuilding and I've got a huge enclosure that I'm in the process of building right now for my big male rhino iguana app that I have at home. Um, it's a uh, 12 foot by eight foot by eight foot tall walk-in enclosure. So it's going to be like his own little outbuilding. It's pretty cool. So. Oh, damn. What are your, uh, what are your considerations when making an outdoor enclosure in, in Florida? Um, if it's a species that can't tolerate the cold, which is most reptiles, you got to either provide them a, a locked in hide box that you can like, like they're, they're, they're smart enough to self-regulate when you give them the options, but like, why risk it? So like, I always make my outdoor, if I, if I leave them in an outdoor hide box for like the, for like a hard freeze, I always check the weather too. Like I'm on the weather channel app, like, like a, like it's my Bible when, when it's cold outside. And then I will, I have out uh hide boxes outside that have like radiant heat panels and things in them and like if i know it's gonna get cold I, i'm sorry you're going in it and i'm locking you in there <laughs> until it's until it's not cold so that that usually works and that's how a lot of like uh big outdoor guys do it here in in florida too and i don't mean to name names but if you think of the big people who have outdoor enclosures here in florida dude that's how they do it for the most part no one's hiking all their animals inside every single night they have big uh you know hide boxes with 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 heat built in so that's the way to do it, honestly. What's the specific temp that you don't want it to get below? Oh, that's it's technically species dependent, but like honestly, if I see like it's species dependent, that's a really hard thing to like drive. Even like down. say a uh, rhino iguana. Oh, I wouldn't let him experience under like sixty five. To be honest, I I don't even want him to experience into the sixties, but I kind of trust his ability to self regulate at that point. So if it's like if he starts touching like the low 70s and stuff, I keep an eye on him. And when he go if he would go into that 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 hide, I'm like, okay, you're smart. But you know if he if it got any lower than that, I'd be like, no, dumb dumb, you're going in there and you're and you're staying warm. So, 
um, because they do experience like in on Hispaniola where they're from, they experience 60 degree weather. You know, it happens in the dead of winter. They feel that and they have burrows that they go into. So they they will self-regulate to a point. But I do take the guesswork out for them. And if it starts to get too cold for my liking in the in the uh, in the hot box, they go. And I'm sure you guys can experience. I mean, shit, when we were down there for Carpet Fest, I think we experienced about 40 degrees at night. So That's too cold. Uh, That's too cold for just about everything, unless it's literally from here. And I have the proper, so that's the other thing too, just cause it's from where you're from, doesn't mean you're giving it the options it needs. You know, if you have, like if I have a yellow belly slider, but he's in one foot of water and it gets 30 degrees, it's not as, it's not conducive like it would if he had two and a half, three feet of water and substrate. Um, you know, that's, that's, you give them the options to, to bunker down how they bunker down in the wild, basically, if you're going to do that sort of cowboy behavior. But other than that, <laughs> dude, just if it gets under, Whatever, whatever threshold you know that animal is not going to experience health issues with. Um, and if it starts to approach that threshold, you do something about it. So, Sweet. As far as, uh, as, far as inside, I mean, do you have, you have 68 animals? Do you have, uh, do you have multiple rooms going on or uh, how is it set up? There's a little bit of bleed over. The vast majority of them are, are, are relegated to the reptile room. You know, everyone's got a reptile room. Um, our reptile room, for the most part, stays like... 80 it's like between 78 and 81 82 degrees you know depending on the time of year um and then of course each enclosure has its own little mini biome but uh we have a couple animals that also uh exist in in our house at large and of course it's a little chillier but we're kind of cold-blooded people so our house is usually somewhere in like the mid 70s anyway um so it's never usually a huge huge deal but we, yeah we've got enclosures in like every single room at least one <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we all do. So what kind of, uh, do you have them split up species or, I mean, amphibians here, reptiles there, anything? Um, do I, do I even have any amphibians at the house right now? Um, I don't think I have any amphibians. If I do, they're escaping my mind right now. Uh, for the most <laughs> part, for the most part, their organization is coincidental. Uh, and so I guess they do kind of end up organized by species, but it's more just like that's because I got all those at the same time sort of deal or like, oh, that's just where they fit sort of deal. Uh, less of like, a, oh, all my geckos are going over here and all my, you know, colubrids are going over here or whatever. Um, the only one I have like, like a large quantity of in particular is false water cobras, which are my one of my passion species. I absolutely am so in love with hydrodynasties. They're they're amazing animals. And uh, they're kind of my, they're, they're my hot for now. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're my, they're my hot before I actually get my hot license on the books, which should be cross my fingers, you know, uh, probably early next year. So I, I don't want to get off subject cause I want to talk about fa uh, false water cobras more, but, um, who are you doing your hours with and how is that coming along? Oh, uh, I'm doing it with a few different people. Honestly, now it's, it's coming to the point where it's going to be a, uh, uh, takes a village to raise a hot keeper sort of thing. Less just one guy because, circumstance has, has driven me in that direction. Um, I started, I did my very first hours ever with a fellow by the name of uh, Tony Daly Cruz. He is the uh, CEO, uh, the head honcho in charge, if you will, of the Rattlesnake Conservancy, formerly the Eastern Diamondback Conservation Foundation. Um, and they do a lot of really, really, really good work with Crotalus. They started with Eastern Diamondbacks as their flagship species. And then when Tony started branching off into other pit viper species and mostly crotalids, he was like, oh, we got to do a little rebranding. Um, and I was actually on board for that rebranding, which was really, really cool. I was there when they announced it and everything. And it's such an awesome organization. And I still work with them to this day, but now Tony lives in Arizona. Um, and so that's kind of a challenge to do any hours through him when he lives, uh, you know, across the country from me. Um, but ever since then, you know, I've started to, to do hours out at Ashton Biological Preserve here as well. Um, which is just outside of uh, Gainesville. I live in Archer, so it's literally down the street for me, um, where it's my neighborhood. Um, so I go out there and I work with Chase Pirtle, who's the land manager out there, and he does awesome work with native species as well. And uh, I've got a couple other people sort of like lined up to like give me hours here, give me hours there when they can, when their schedule is free enough to get me in their hot rooms. But dude, it's such a, it's such a chore, and it's no one's fault. But it is such a chore to get in someone's hot room and actually document hours. It is so, so, so difficult. Schedules lining up, the whole awkward meet and greet. It's almost like you're hiring an employee, you know, for a temporary amount of time. It's, it's, it is a, it's a hard circle to get into, you know. So it's, uh, but I've, I've been making my way 
Stella. And are you are you trying to get that? I think because it's it's kind of like family specific, I guess you would call it. So like pit yeah. vipers, is that what you're going for? Is it? It is in Florida. It's family specific. So you have to do a thousand hours uh, with each family you want to keep. Or uh, an FWC doesn't advertise this quite a lot, but you can do five hundred hours and a test, which mm -hmm. is way easier, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Someone who's more qualified, but I believe uh, you still have to do it over the course of a year. So you either have to do a thousand hours over the course of at least a year, or you have to do 500 hours and a test, but it still has to be over the course. Of, like you can't get it in sooner in than one. Or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, it's a thousand hours with Viperidae. It's a thousand hours with Lapidae. It's a thousand hours with Colubridae. And it's a thousand hours with Heloderma. So if you want to keep a Hilo monster, you have to somehow convince someone to let you hang out in their Heloderma room for a thousand hours. And <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, you know, I can I can think of a thousand hours worth of stuff to do with like mambas and you know and like big lapid species. I it's, it's, I struggle to come up with a thousand hours of things to do with a with a Mexican beaded lizard. So yeah. So going back to false water cobras, are you working with uh, wild types, morphs? Uh, what do you have? Um. So yeah, I'm working with both. I started with wild types, uh, and now I've kind of got a little bit of a project going that's not. It is my project and it's not my project at the same time. And yes, it does deal with a particular recessive morph in false water cobras. That's very, very awesome. Um, but it's kind of got to stay on the hush hush for now. Um, but I do deal with like, I've got a hypo and I've got a head hypo and then I got a bunch of normals and then I got a couple of visuals and a couple of hats for that thing that shall not be named. Um, and then, uh, but I, I started with, go ahead. No, no, I'm just trying to like, oh, there's one that I really, really love. And yeah, I'll, I'll send the, the, you the only other one that I know of. Yeah, yeah. If you could, I'll, send you, sweet. A, I'll send you a picture afterwards. I'm sure it's the one you're thinking of. It's the one <laughs> everyone knows of theirs. But um, it's I, I fell in love with them first and it was kind of childlike of me, but I was hanging out with some other hot keeper uh, at a uh, at, a, at an event, I was actually at the Venomous Herpetology Symposium um, a couple years ago, and I was like, man, what's the what's the hottest thing you can keep without your permit? And I was just being a, a, a jackass, and the, the person was like, good friend of mine, actually, he was like, I probably false water cobras, you know, that's what I'd say. And at the time, I was like, what's that? And I went down the rabbit hole, and I, when I tell you I've never fallen in love with a snake faster, dude, I love these snakes, and they're such assholes. They are such assholes and but they're such good eaters but and they're they're so bad at hook work and like they're just such cantankerous shitheads of a snake but i love them more than any other colubrid i've ever worked with man and so now i have uh 12 total <laughs> so damn yeah. so how do you have those set up do you have those done uh by um no dude oh my god that's actually a project in the future that's why i really want to I mean, I go to the bathroom a lot right Oh, dude, so they poop. Crazy. They poop constantly. They're like, dude, honestly, behaviorally and like physiologically, they're a lot like Kribos. They're a lot like Dry Marcon. And so, like, they are eating constantly and pooping constantly. And they're actually a weird species because, and someone had to tell me this. I was like, man, why am I not finding a lot of poop in my enclosure sometimes? Because I know they're shitting all the time. Like, where's all this poop going? And I had a friend tell me that they're caprophagic, that they, like, left to their own devices, will like recycle their poop. And I was like, are you kidding me? And so now I, I try, apparently it doesn't bother them, but I've tried to catch poop every single time they poop. Now I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't eat that. But apparently they'll do that. And so, cause I was wondering why the poops were really well processed and I wasn't finding as much of them as I thought I would. So, um, but yeah, they would do really well in a bioactive, I think, um, in no small part because they wouldn't, you know, their, their poop would get handled hopefully before they could eat it. Um, but I, that's a project in the future right now. I have them in vision cages. My big, my four big adults I have in vision cages. And then all my younger ones are, are technically they're in a tub system. So, you know, shame on me, right? They're in a tub, they're in a rack, but, uh, <laughs> but they're young. They're all dare sub you. two. Yeah. Right. They're all sub two feet, but they're all in like, uh, the, um, that's not the, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a tub breeder so i actually don't know the, the dimensions of the tub right off hand but it's not like i think it might be a 40 or, or bigger maybe it's like a couple feet by like a foot and a half or two feet. at least something. a sweater box yeah. yeah oh absolutely it's a sweater box yeah no 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 doubt and then they're only like two foot snakes so it's still relatively appropriate it's no no big deal but i plan on 
I plan on in the future when I've got a little bit more free time and, and liquid capital to throw at it, I plan on doing some really, really cool setups for breeding with them. So how so big is uh how big is a large adult? I don't think I've ever seen one full grown. I always see um, my reptile shows kind of in between. I don't, I don't like to tell fish stories, but my big <laughs> my big girl is like God, she's over six. She has to be. She's got to be like, um, I don't know, six and some change. I really don't. I always undersize my animals. That's what people tell me. I'm like, oh, it's like five feet. And they're like, Chance, that's a seven foot snake. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so I would venture to say she's she's at least six feet. She's every inch of six feet long. And she's big, dude. She's like Kribo big around. I, uh, I used to use her as my garbage disposal. Because like, you know, if some other animal in the collection didn't eat, she would, she would eat. There's no doubt about it. And then one day I realized that I was sometimes tossing her like three rodents. And then I go, <laughs> and I, I noticed some little, like, I noticed a little bit of the skin between those scales. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I have been overfeeding you. I don't care how fast your metabolism is. I have been overfeeding you. Um, so I had to dial back on her and she's of course beautiful now, but, um, but yeah, they'll eat, their appetites are, are insane. They'll eat anything and they will eat as much of it as you will feed them. Do you know about how long it takes to get from a uh, adulthood or to sexual maturity? Um, if you didn't ask me, I would have been able to tell you right offhand. But I think it's like it's like a little over two years for a boy, or maybe like a little under two, like around the two year mark for a boy, and and more for a girl, a little bit more for a girl. I usually go by more like grams, like gram weight, and like in length. Like I'm not going to breed a female until I see enough size on her that those eggs aren't going to kill her because they got big eggs too. They've got like proportional to their body size, big old eggs like ball python style, like relative to their body. So they don't they don't have like little little skinny long colubrid eggs. They got big old eggs. So I always make sure my girls are are really really chunky and long before I breed them. I'm I, and I'm not like. And I'm again not trying to call anybody out, but I'm not one of those people who's like, as soon as they're ready to breed, I'm gonna breed them. So I just I'm not as worried about it. I wait until I'm like that snake is huge and healthy and ready to breed. You know, I'm not looking for some bare minimum. Uh, just got over the the you know I had to go on my tiptoes to ride the ride sort of you know uh, um, standard. You know, I wait till they're obviously and visually ready to breed. So. Are they are they winter breeders or spring breeders? Uh, they're they're uh where are we right now? We're at the beginning of spring. They're like beginning of spring breeders. They're they're all locking up right now. Um, they're like fresh. I'd say like fresh out of winter breeders. Maybe like early early winter. Um, I've never looked at like the exact lockup months. You know, because people get really really specific with that. But I've always noticed, man, as soon as the rains come back, that's the that's as soon as the rains come back, that's when they're ready to go. So it's usually early spring. Um, and then they'll lock up all the way through spring if you let them. Uh, if I open the window, dude, if it's raining outside and I open the window, it probably doesn't matter what time of year it is. If I threw them together, they'd lock up. So they're they're huge on that barometric pressure shift, uh, way more than temperature. And this is, you know, I'm no I'm no researcher in the middle of Brazil, but I would venture to say it's probably because they don't receive a whole lot of temperature shift throughout the year. You know, they're always somewhere in the 70s. Um, and so I'd venture to say that the, the weather patterns, the, the wet and dry season is far more of a regulatory body for them than, than temperature is. I've never cycled mine and I've never had any issues with them locking up, never cycled them temperature wise. You know, mm -hmm. I definitely cycle them humidity wise. Like I give them a dry season through the winter and then I let the rains come back down to, to Florida and they, and they lock up. That's awesome, man. So, so about how long until you think you're going to have some eggs? Oh, big girl. She's, uh, she's locked up. She'll be the first one to lay. I'd imagine. Um, I'll probably have eggs in the next two weeks, probably maybe a little longer, three weeks. And then it's like a, it's like a standard like two month incubation. So a couple months I should have some little babies and they come out big and they come out angry and they come out hungry. You know, they come out over like 10 inches long. Um, so they're, they're pretty good sized little babies and they're sometimes hard to start. They like to start on fish and frogs because that's what they eat in the wild. Um, and I've never done my own personal research on this. And I guess you can flog me for that. But I've taken advice from people who have worked with these species a lot longer than I have. A lot of people say not to keep them on fish and frogs, despite that that's what they eat in the wild. They say that rodents are like the preferred captive diet for them, um, which is un like that's not true for some other species like dry marcon. I know a lot of people are like, don't feed it just rodents. You're going to kill it. Um, but with 
hundred dynasties, uh, the prevailing wisdom seems to be get them on rodents and they're fine on rodents. Um, but you usually start them on fish and frogs and then you start scenting pinkies and things like that to get them to take uh, and switch over onto rodents. So. And what, what have you seen as the average clutch size? Uh, 20 probably give or take, I'd say, um, I've seen bigger clutches. Obviously I've seen closer to 30, 26 ish, something like that eggs. But, uh, uh, average is probably around probably around 20. Um, so I'm going to bring have, you I should have a notebook for all this, shouldn't I? <laughs> should no, I, I, I didn't mean to be so specific. I told you I wasn't <laughs> going to like ask specific questions. No, I'm you're curious fine. about it. You're fine. Um, I'm just answering offhand too. I'm sure I could if I if I like went back and referenced, you know, my past experiences, I'm sure I could be a little more specific, but uh, just offhand I'm pretty sure it's like around 20 eggs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean that's that's better than uh, whoever's listening. Uh, just take him for his word, okay? We're, we're ballparking <laughs> it. We're just talking like normal people. Yeah, exactly. Um, so as far as getting, getting the babies go, do you have to scent at all? Or oh, like yeah. uh, saying the fish and stuff like that? How do you go about doing that? Um, so some of them you don't. I try pinkies first. And if the if the little dude takes pinkies, the little dude takes pinkies. It's a victory. He's going to be a winner. You know, amazing. But uh, a lot of the times, if they won't take a pinky first, you just start with uh, like a minnow, you know, and, or a, or a, a frog. And then when you have to go to scent, I mean, I just take a frozen minnow that I thaw out and then I crush it up and I roll a pinky in it. And oh there yeah, you go. He, he's scented. Yeah, because the lovely thing about fish and amphibians is their juices are present and their juices are everywhere. So you can kind of just take that little pinky and and based him so to speak in the flavors of of the uh the amphibians and the fish and and they take to them pretty quickly i uh, you know i've had i've actually only successfully had you know one season before this and they've taken to them really really well so that's awesome and how long does it usually take to to make that transition are there some that take it you know take rodents right away and what are kind of how many do you see are you have to scent and, and mess with that much um, ah, it's like different for every, I different for every clutch I'd say. Uh, but I, it's like I don't know, half and half probably just about, you know, there's, there's definitely some good ones. A lot of them go to rats right away. Um, they don't have any issues, but, uh, I don't, I don't typically have any, like, I say typically like I've been doing this forever, but like, I don't typically have any trouble, uh, transferring them over. Even if it's just a one or two times getting them, getting a fish or an amphibian down their throat, they usually switch over pretty quick. So yeah, it's not terrible. I mean, I just wonder. I wonder why we haven't seen so many in the hobby. I mean, they're still being imported a lot, and I don't see many captain born and bred. Dude, there's a there's an obscure species. I got so I got started from a from a fella who is probably like the go to on them, uh, who could blow my knowledge out of the water by a landslide. Uh, his name is Ken Robertson, um, and he is more or less retired now but he's one of those old heads man that's been doing it since the dawn of time and i got my very first female from him and he's a wizard with them and he produced them for years and years and years um but besides him dude i think I, you're right like there's not a lot of people captive uh producing them and not only did i fall in love with them as a species when i got my first one but i looked around and i was like i don't know a lot of people producing these and so i decided that that was going to be not only a passion species for me but probably like a project species that i'll probably be known for one day you know down the road when i've got some gray hairs and people are like oh it's chance jake he's an expert you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah, he's, he was the false water cobra guy back in the day but right now i'm, I'm smack in the middle of that part of the, the getting that legacy process <laughs> yeah i think i think that's something to to strive for i mean it it can kind of sound weird when you say that like uh like, especially like I have those projects too, where it's like, I hope that someday I'm that guy doing this, but I mean, it's nice to have a few of those. And like, even if it's something ridiculous, at least, you know, be the, the Cuban night and old guy. I don't know. Be... Yeah, dude. I'm, do your thing. I'm, I'm absolutely. So people will come to me all the time and they'll like, uh, oh, you know, I'm actually a really big fan of you know, this species and they don't want to talk about it. Cause like they're, they think people will judge them, but like, dude, if that's your passion species, that's your passion species work with them. I don't care if it's toke geckos or night anoles, or I don't know, pick some other, you know, trash species that you want to come up with. Like they're, that they're, they're all awesome animals. And if you want to work with them, you want to work with them. That's your, that's your cup of tea, man. Yeah. Someone figure out a uh, Asian vine snakes or something ridiculous or something that costs $5, but no one can keep alive exactly work on it work on it because the lord knows at the rate that we're destroying habitats we won't have them we won't be able to import those five dollar animals forever man so somebody work on it 
Yeah, that's for sure. What other what other projects do you have going o- over there? Oh, I'd love to breed the Spilotes. Um, unfortunately, my male that I have right now is not a stellar male. You know, he was wild caught. There's no way around it. It's really hard to find captive born specimens of them as well. Um, and he's not he's not doing really, really well either. So I don't think he's going to be much of a breeder for me moving forward. But that's a project. I would love to be one of the first people to do ornate flying snakes uh, consistently. I've got a trio of them that I'm working with. Those are um, sick, I, dude. They are sick, dude. And they're they're another one of those weird species that's like flying snakes. Why the hell would you work with them? But that's always been me. I've always been into weird fringe stuff. Um, I think deep down I'm a lizard guy, to be quite honest. But they're just such a pain to keep in large quantities that I haven't really branched out into it. But you just wait till I got Thai Park money, and then I'll be uh, <laughs> then I'll be I'll be throwing down some really cool uh, agamid and iguanid and and. Um, you know, bigger lizard uh, and enclosures and, and breeding projects and stuff. But uh, right now it's mostly snakes just because that's the easiest one to house. Um, I honestly, breeding for me isn't a profit thing. Um, I don't, not getting, like I have a very good friend of mine who I've referenced previously who is uh, a, a breeder and he's like a for-profit, ethical, super ethical, but he's a for-profit breeder. And every time I think of some new wacky species that I want to try to breed, he's like, why, man? Like, what? You're not going to sell that. There's no market for that species. And I'm like, why do you think that that's why I'm breeding it? I'm not breeding it because I want to sell them. I'm breeding it because these animals are cool and I want to be one of the first people to breed them. So, you know, that's, that's kind of why I get into something. It's just because I'm passionate about it, not because I plan on making a buck. You know, I have my business, you know, my business is not me being a breeder. My business is me being a retailer. Um, so whatever I breed is, is a, is a personal thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think people get it twisted sometimes thinking that because they're, they're going to become that guy in that species that they're going to be able to make money on it. Well, oh yeah, not necessarily. I mean, it's not a pied ball python. I mean, there's going to be 10 people that, that care about your water python or, you, you know. Exactly. Yeah. I'm the guy who figured out how to breed sunbeam snakes. Like, yes, good for you. You and your 15 friends will love that. And they should. <laughs> you and your 15 friends should love that. There's nothing wrong with that but you're not going to make a million dollars doing it. So no, no, but I mean, I think that's, uh, that's what's cool about the little niche of the hobby that is carved out for people who are, I don't know, just into, into funky shit. And I think it's, it's nice that we are, we're now breeding species so we don't have to import them and get wild costs as much kind of like you were saying before. Absolutely, dude. I'm a huge, huge, huge proponent of that. And like, that's, that's honest. I didn't even get to extrapolate on it too much earlier when I brought it up, but like, that's one of the reasons why, uh, the captive wildlife industry can help the research industry and the, and the, uh, I say industry, the research field and the conservation field is if we can find ways to ethically and appropriately and successfully breed and maintain the, all of these animals in captivity, that takes such an immense pressure off of their natural environments and also it gives us a genetic fallback and and i guess it's a you know kind of a a human selfishness thing to just want to be able to preserve for the sake of preservation but it gives us a genetic fallback for these animals when we do decimate their habitats you know um and like uh, obviously the preferable response would be to not decimate their habitats but call it human selfishness if we lose the habitat i at least like to have the animal preserved for posterity you know it's some way to make sure that that animal keeps sticks around with us biodiversity is is a beautiful thing man so yeah absolutely speaking of which the the breeding of animals and stuff because have you seen uh tiger king yet on Netflix? oh my gosh no i haven't <laughs> so no i haven't but i have seen and this i still don't even know like the premise premise but i have seen like 10 statuses and like I've heard like five different people already talking about it. So yeah, it's gonna be a must watch for me, I'm sure. Um, it's about like the uh the, the like little cub trade, right? Like the like taking photos with tiger cubs and then what happens to them after sort of thing. But it's it's more about the people behind it. And if you could just it's even hard to imagine what the, what level of human being these people are. Like between uh, like just complete narcissists borderline sociopaths to just complete scumbag trash and yeah. everything in between. And they yeah. all interact with each other and they oh, all yeah. just happen to have tigers. And oh. it's, it's, I mean, you can't stop watching it. It's like, it's like a fucking train wreck. Oh man. I'm, I'm positive dude. And then if that isn't the history of the wildlife trade, man, like it's, it's so funny when you think about how the, 
history of of the success of the reptile trade in the United States is like founded not on the back of people who are enthusiastic about keeping reptiles, but it was founded on the back of like drug runners. Like like that's the, the, the reptiles. They, they talk about, about that actually in Tiger King about oh, you know exactly. the like cocaine and boa constrictors type deal. Yep. Oh yeah, and dude. And tell me tell me if they got it right because if if they didn't get it right, here's another thing that they did. You take a boa constrictor. You oh wait, I probably shouldn't teach people how to do this, should I? I mean, it say, everyone. It's science at this point. History and science. They, they used to cut open boa constrictors south of the border and insert cocaine or uncut gems or whatever. They decided they were going <laughs> to smuggle across the border. And back in the day when it was still like, oh, no, that's a snake. I'm not touching it. They'd come across the border like pretty much scot-free and these animals would still be alive. And then they would take them into whatever facility landed them whatever wholesale retail facility landed them warehouse usually in homestead florida or miami or somewhere <laughs> down there How almost, dare you? that's too almost, specific dude almost without he's, he's a tiger king dude while they're talking about that while they're talking about it there's video and then he cups a gaboon viper with his hand like he he puts it in a deli cup and puts the lid on with his hands and shit oh it's amazing yeah, they would cut those snakes open once they landed, remove whatever the contraband was, sew that snake up, and then sell it back into the captive trade. Completely, like, that's fine. You know, that snake would live. After a couple sheds, you don't even know it ever got cut open. It's crazy, dude. The, the wildlife, it was cowboys. And you know what's really funny, too, is I knew about these stories sort of early in my life because I grew up in Florida. And in my little brain, it was every single state did this. You know, every single state had their <laughs> every single state had their their kingpin that was like a wildlife trafficker and that you know sold sold drugs and everything like that. I was like, oh yeah, that's got to be you know the world's huge. It's got to be everywhere, right? And then as I got older, I was like, oh no, it's just Florida. Like, that's it's a Florida weird. thing. Oh, that's just us, Port of Miami, man. It's an interesting place. So that's why yeah, I mean. If you got if you got an animal like a twenty five year old animal right now with a scar up its belly, I mean that's kind of badass. Oh yeah, man! You know that that thing was carrying emeralds at one point, or or cocaine or something similar. Dude, it's <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> yeah, man, you gotta you gotta check that. I mean, it's not a. It's just fucking interesting. I don't want to. I don't want to do any spoilers for anyone. Right. I'm. I'm gonna go watch it. I'm gonna be like, oh man, that's that story I told on that podcast. Well, I put it right here on the. That's so funny. Yeah. There you that's go. I mean, it's public information, so. Right. But yeah, I mean, growing up in Florida, it must be weird. Just, I mean, just if you if you talk about around where you are, I can think of like five very big guys in the reptile industry that are you know in the Gainesville area. Oh yeah, absolutely, dude. I mean, uh, Cody Bartolini is right outside of town, the other direction from me. That's we met at his at his property. That's where we met in, in person for the first time at Carpet Fest. And then uh, uh, I got Ben Cole reptiles right across the street from me. I've got Eugene Bissett down the road. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's an old head mm -hmm. in the industry. Uh, Stephen Tillis, who's like one of the head, one of the dudes spearheading the Nida virus research and the Sepenter virus research. He's literally across the street from me. Um, yeah, it's a bit, my own, one of my best friends in the whole world, his name is Brad Thomas. He's the uh, owner of snakes and stuff, which is a big ball Python breeding, you know, thing. <gasps> so, yeah, I got to show for yes. him real quick. No, he does good stuff, dude. He's, he's that ethical <laughs> breeder. I keep referencing. He's good people. Um, but he's awesome. He's right here out North of town. Like there's a concentration of breeders in Alachua County and just people who own large quantities of, of wildlife. People would never, wouldn't believe that this random little college town has everything it does around it. And that's not why I picked it. You know, my family, my family happened to live here. We were bar industry people historically, and my family opened a bar here. If you're friend, if you're in the Gainesville area, my family's bar is, is Balls. Uh, it's a sports bar on University Avenue, right across the street from the from the university. We've owned that bar since 1989, when when it when we opened it, or when like the Midtown industry started becoming a thing. Um, so it was happenstance, pure happenstance, that I moved up here from South Florida when we did, and. And it happened to be a, a huge reptile mecca randomly out in the middle of nowhere. So, yeah, I mean, even when we were on our way to Cody's place, we passed like a big cat place, and I was like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, dude, I was single vision. Yeah, that's single, like, right? Like on the same street as him, right? Yeah, like literally on the same street. And I was like, "Holy shit!" How many animal people are out here, and oh, what is out here? Absolutely, you go out to Citra, dude. It's the same thing. You get the more boondocks you get, like the more farther away from civilization, the more it's just acreage with exotic animals on it. So yeah, 
Yeah, and it's like I guess I guess that kind of it bodes well to the fact that I mean, with all these legislations happening and stuff like that, it seems like at least you have a lot of people and a lot of industry going on around you to where hopefully, you know, someone can stick up, you know, for for you guys. Yeah, you'd think you'd think they'd all come together, right, and play on the same team and <laughs> get stuff done, right? You'd, th you'd think they'd all be like, you know what, this is all of our industry, and we should all be friends, and let's make sure all of our livelihoods are preserved. But you'd be shocked at how little cooperation <laughs> there is in this industry. Uh, U.S. Arc does a really good job of trying. You know, they they do a really good <laughs> job of trying. But guys, guys, come together, please. Let's do something about this. Um, but uh, and and we do like Eugene, uh, Ophiological Services. He does a great job. He's he always is, is speaking at, at meetings and speaking at hearings and going on TV and stuff like he's he's big into standing up for it, too. But you'd, you'd be shocked how many people we could have, you know, towing that line. But uh, but we also are a certain breed of of um, hermit type people. You know, we're, we're less not, than not people, so, people. Yeah, exactly. We're not not big on the spotlight. So, you know, they don't they don't like to show up to, to town hall meetings. So, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we've got too many I, animals to take care of. <laughs> yeah, I mean the 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 thing we have going for us is that we're not as crazy as the big cat people, and now everyone knows that, so that's good. Yeah, exactly, we've got that bar set where we're like, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa! Look at those people with the tigers; they're crazier than us. You know, if you want to point fingers, you know who to point fingers at. <laughs> Absolutely, but I mean, gr growing up in Florida is fucking sweet. You ever uh, do you herp at all? Oh my gosh, dude. I herp. Yeah, I herp before I was, I'm a herper before I'm a keeper. That's for sure. hundred um, percent. I I only keep because I can't find those animals in the wild. You know what I mean? Like I can't go herp false water cobras, um, but I'm, I'm definitely a herper first. And I, uh, I actually uh, like my long-term goal is more of a wildlife centered brand. You know, I will always obviously have back there or uh, Gator City Reptiles, but I also have a different brand that I'm sort of, sort of kind of trying to go with. Uh, it's called the Backyard Biologist, uh, you know, patent pending, copyright pending. No one, no one tries to steal it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I run an Instagram right now and I'm starting to trying to drum up a following for that. And I, I want to eventually have the two brands play off one another. One is going to be more of like my personal wildlife brand, um, so to speak not to be one of those guys. Uh, but then the other one is going to be, of course, the shop brand. And I want them to kind of be the marriage of those two universes. You know, this is the, this is the pure wildlife education. This is me just talking to you guys about the beautiful world around me and, and why the natural world is so amazing and why you should be fascinated by it and why you should want to preserve it. And then the other side of the brand is going to be, here's why captive husbandry is also amazing and here's what a shop can do the right way and and that sort of thing and i want those two brands to just bounce off each other as as they grow and and be able to be representative of, of two sides of the same coin you know what i mean so that's my my long long-term goal and so i actually plan on here in the next uh little bit i gotta launch a youtube channel everyone else has one i gotta do that so i plan on launching a youtube channel here in the next couple months or so and then um i plan on like segueing that into some sort of uh series if you will some sort of series on native uh wildlife here in florida because i grew up in florida i'm from the palm trees of south florida and i'm from the pine trees of central florida so um between florida alone and all of its amazing diverse habitats i could do a i could do a 10-part mini series just on florida habitats alone dude, and all the amazing stuff i have found and i plan to find in those in those habitats and and the natural history behind them and why they're so amazing so it's all on the docket Series of non-native animals, fuck yep. native. I mean, there's there's so many. Just it's ridiculous, man. And and like and the stories behind all of them and stuff like that oh, are yeah. funny. Yeah, you know that's actually my inspiration for the first episode too, because that's going to be the buzzword. That's going to be the one that gets everybody. It's going to be like, hey, invasives. You know, what's what's the biggest buzz? If it's not spilling sugar into the Gulf of Mexico, what's the biggest story in in Florida when it comes to like ecology? And it's pythons in the everglades you know it's it's the it's the big invasive scary reptiles from from overseas so yeah i plan on capitalizing on that <laughs> <laughs> what are or what are some of the uh the species that you like to find the most um i guess when i'm urban here in florida i'm a snake guy for sure like through and through um i love our colubrid species i love our pit vipers 
like I'm huge on herp and rattlesnakes and I'm, I'm, you know, partially inspired by the habitat around me and partially inspired by the people I rub elbows with, but I'm a humongous fan of our native pit vipers and our native venomous. Um, but I also like, I like our big stuff and maybe that's just the big dumb dude in me. Like the, oh, I like reticulated pythons cause they're huge, you know, but I like our big stuff. I love indigo snakes. I love pine snakes. I love. Oh, come snakes. on. Everyone loves those. I mean, there's nothing right. wrong with that, yeah, but they're also the big, I don't like them cause they're rare. I like them cause they're huge, man. You know? So I, I like big snakes. I'm a big fan. Um, of course, if I could perp a, uh, you know, a Florida mole king snake, you know, that'd be amazing. Or if I could herp like a rainbow snake, I, I, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't be quiet about that. But uh, the snakes I go out looking for are usually big, big snakes, big, impressive looking snakes. Uh, you won't, and uh, you will find me doing this coincidentally, but you won't find me going out and targeting crown snakes. Sorry, Sean McKnight, if you're watching this, uh, you won't you won't find me going out and targeting Tantilla. Although they're really, really, really cool to find when you are out there. So. Um, that's, have you found how, how I, in the wild no absolutely not that's it is harder than you think and i it's not for a lack of trying i have yeah. tried so hard um and i know people who see him every year and i because i'm uh trying to do the whole instagram thing now I, I i sometimes bump shoulders and elbows with those instagram herpers who are uh have some sort of magic imbued into their snake hooks and every log they flip they seem to find and i know that's downplaying it you know they put a lot a lot a lot of work into finding these animals but i know a lot of guys who find like a dozen indigos a year and it's a weird it's a weird situation if they don't find one and it's like i'm just like how how do you do this i try so hard and i just can't seem to turn one over and they're huge they're freaking seven foot snakes and i can't find one <laughs> Dude, I mean, just talking to uh, at Coverfest, talking to KJ, and he just he's like uh, scrolling past pictures, like, oh yeah, that's the indigo that I found. Blah blah. blah. I'm like, oh god, how? That's, that is me with pine snakes, though. Oddly enough, like people like are like, man, where do you find a Florida pine snake? Oh my god, they're so hard to find. I haven't heard one. Blah blah blah. And I've hit like four in the past year. And like two of them were accidents, you know, two of them I just happened upon on the road. And I was like, oh, look at that, Florida pine snake, you know. Um, so I guess it's everyone's got a species they're lucky with. I don't know. But uh, Are they yeah. uh, wandering males? I mean, is that what you would typically find? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they spend so much time underground, right? What, pine snakes? Yeah. I would assume, I suppose. I don't necessarily probe everyone I catch. Uh, but I uh, like it. I, one, I know for a fact might have very well been like it might have been territorial because the burrow that it was going to was like right there in eye shot and they they love gopher tortoise burrows and there's a lot of gopher tortoises around me which which helps quite a bit so it could be i'm smack in the in the middle of the habitat that they prefer to to roam around in anyway so the odds of it being a roaming male as opposed to a, a female within her known range is just as likely um and there's a lot of dirt roads around me too so they don't they don't balk at crossing dirt roads like they do uh uh asphalt pavement one i know that definitely was a male i was i was tubing down the sawani river uh like well, almost this time last year and uh a huge snake dipped into the water in front of me and i wasn't with snake people and they were like snake snake oh my god snake kill it throw the beer at it whatever and i was like well what are you being at it yeah, exactly. Cletus. Uh, no, um, they were like, I was like, no, no, easy, easy. It's just a big yellow rat snake. Like, clearly, it's just a big yellow rat snake. And then as it like crossed in front of my tube, I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> it was a huge pine snake. And I dove in the water. And of course, that was like the last thing I would think would be, you know, swimming in the water. I Exactly. Yeah, that, that was my thought process, too. That, that's why I was so positive that it was a huge yellow rat snake until it was right there in front of me. And I was like, oh, I stand corrected. And that, that almost had to be a male. I can't see why a female would cross one of the wider rivers in my area, you know, just incidentally, because she was hunting. Uh, wouldn't happen. So it's a metaphor for all men out there, you know. We'll go yeah, all right. The, the links we go through, man, is that our horm hormones drive us to do just it's we climb mountains, man. We really would. <laughs> have you found uh eastern diamondbacks at all yeah um i not as many as i would like um i try to i try to herp them at least once a year but to be honest with you uh, it's been 
kind of sparse lately. And I think that that's starting to become a result of just how much people are blowing their heads off, dude. It's, it's crazy around here. I get way more calls about, Hey, will you pick up this body? than Hey, will you come identify this, you know, East, living Eastern diamondback? So it's, it's a lot of, I, I probably get one a year if I'm really, really lucky, if I, unless I'm looking for them, if I'm looking for them, it's a little different, but like if incidentally just in, in road cruising and stuff around here, I get like one a year, which is really sad because this used to be a hotbed for them. And we really just don't see as money anymore. If you know the spots, they're still there, but if you're near suburbia or like farmland and stuff like that, it's shocking how few there are. And the few you hear about usually uh, end up with lead in them. So yeah, Which is part nice. of why the part of why the rattlesnake conservancy does the work that it does. So, yeah, is that is that a thing around where you are? Because I mean, being like the the local reptile store, do people send you pictures all the time and send you weird things about snakes that they killed and whatnot? Constantly, constantly, and it's so funny too. I, I've always had the uh, the hey, what kind of snake is this? photo sent to my inbox. You know, because I've, I've been the reptile guy in my friend groups since I was a kid. Um, and so I've always been that dude, but ever since I've got the store, of course has, there's been an uptick of it. And it's always blows my mind. The like cognitive dissonance that people have when they're like, uh, Oh, Hey, here's this mangled corpse of an animal that I know you absolutely love. Will you ID it for me? Oh, also I'm the one who killed it. And uh, I spat on it after I killed it. You know, like they, they're like very <laughs> malicious. About yeah. that. I ruined, I ruined its credit score before I chopped its head off. You know, like they're, they're very malicious about the way that they did it to this animal. And they're like, by the way, can you identify it? I'm like, if I sent you a picture of a fluffy Pomeranian that I had done that to, you would, I'd be in cuffs. I'd be in handcuffs. Um, but because it's a scaly soulless monster, you know, people don't have the same, like it doesn't register to them that that's sending me this picture. And I'm fine with getting the picture. It's not that I don't mind getting the picture because I'd love to identify that snake for you. It's the sort of cavalier attitude people have about the corpse that they show me. It's not like a, Hey, I'm sorry. I had to do this. Will you identify it? I, I felt, I feared for my life. I have dogs, whatever, you know, I was worried. It's kind of like a look at the size of this dumbass snake. I chopped up and blah, blah, blah. By the way, what is it? You know, and so that that's what gets me is I'm like, really? Like that's the way you're gonna handle this thing you know I love. <laughs> so yeah, 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 I don't I don't get why that doesn't compute ever. Uh ah, we're reptile people, man. Maybe we don't maybe we don't tick the same way. So I don't know. <laughs> it's probably after <laughs> Yeah. That's, that's us. But uh do you as far as uh getting out of state, do you get to herp anywhere else? Oh, I wish. Um I'm such a Florida like I barely get to travel. I've been out of state like a dozen times in my entire life, which I know is pathetic for being 26 <laughs> years old and living in the United States. Um, but I've been like to New York, which isn't great herping. Sorry, my New Yorker friends who herp. Uh, it's not fantastic. It's cool if you like uh, like salamanders and stuff, right? They got salamanders up there, don't they? And like frogs. yeah, I mean <laughs> yeah, but I mean I just I actually flipped one in my backyard. I was I was doing. Uh, you know, I was doing some yard work and I found some isopods and, uh, and the salad. So that, that's about all you get. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, no, that's cool too, man. Absolutely. Uh, but I've been to New York and I've been to, uh, been like west a little bit uh, to like Alabama, Louisiana, that area. But dude, I thought I, you were going to say like Colorado, Utah, California. I, no. But, oh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's good herping, honestly. Uh, yeah. All of those yeah. places. So. No, I would, I would kill to go to Arizona. I would kill to go to like Nevada or, uh, or, um, like New Mexico, Texas, like places where there's like really, really good still, you know, Southern hot herping where you get big snakes and, and a lot more rattlesnake variety and stuff. And, and I actually plan on doing a trip. It was going to be this year, but hopefully now maybe next year, um, to Costa Rica, you know, my first trip over the border. And I want it to be somewhere where I know there's good herping. And I know that I'm not, you know, going to lose a, a kidney, um, you know, somewhere that's pretty American friendly and would deal with my uh, dumb tourist sensibilities pretty well. And so Co Costa Rica is a really good choice for that. Costa Rica or Belize, you know, I don't want to find myself in Honduras and be like, hello, guys, where's the bathroom? You know, and, and <laughs> hola. yeah, hola, como estas? Uh, me llamo chance. You know, I don't want to be doing that. So, um so I, I want to start somewhere that's still exotic. You know, I can find some eyelash wipers and some bothrops and cool neato stuff like that, but somewhere where I can still, um, 
speak English in my American ignorance, you know what I mean? And, and still get the job done because I'm, uh, I'm an American. So we're, we suck at learning other languages <laughs> and we suck at being culturally, uh, considerate. So I want to go somewhere where my sensibilities aren't going to stand out as bad right at first. So, um, but yeah, that, that I love to do some more out there herping and believe me, I'm going to document all of it. Cause I got an Instagram page to fill with content. So, but, uh, but yeah, there you go. Are you gonna, uh, is your, is your video going to have Tyler in it? You going to try <laughs> to get him in on some, some YouTube, try to get some clout. Yeah, he's a busy dude. And like, I've been hitting him up for like so long now and it's not like, and I get it too. Um, I've, it was weird because we knew each other. We were closer when we were very young. Um, he's a couple years older than me and we were closer when we were very young. Like we always used to go to like family reunions and stuff. Cause we both lived in South Florida and Pompano uh, or around Pompano. Um, and like, it was cool, but neither one of us knew that the other was going to grow up to be a reptile person. And that's that weird, like, man. Right. Oh uh, yeah. When I say I'm the black sheep, I'm the black sheep of my cousin lineage. He's the black sheep of the other one. Like his, the rest of his family is, is not, uh, super into reptiles either from what I'm aware of. You could have a weird uncle. I don't know. Um, but we're, uh, our, we share my grandfather and his grandfather were brothers. Um, but we come from a Southern family. And so Southern families are like ridiculously close knit. Like, you know, your second, third, fourth cousin removed. Like, well, I know a family that's a cousin to my grandfather's like cousin. Like it's, it's weird how tight you are when you come from like a very traditional Southern family. Um, but we grew apart, you know, obviously we never were like, we didn't end up going to grade school in the same area. So we, ne we didn't end up knowing that we were both going to be reptile people, which was so strange. And then I, of course, saw him on uh, Ink Masters or whatever the hell it was. And then I was like, hey, that's my cousin. And then, you know, he started getting <laughs> famous for like handling snakes and stuff. I'm like, I handle snakes. What? That's crazy. And so at first it was definitely just like, I want to connect with my cousin on a level that that we didn't, you know, have a chance to because we knew, neither of us knew we were going to be reptile people. Um, but then, yeah, once I saw his clout grow, I was like, heck yeah, I want to hop in on some of that clout. Who does it? Like you, lied <laughs> and you said you didn't want a shout out from somebody with X number of thousands of followers. Um, and like, and like I said, at the end of the day, I think it takes all people. So like, I'm not super judgy when it comes to that stuff. You won't catch me free handling, but you won't catch me wagging my finger as hard at free handlers as other people will, because it's your life, dude. I don't think it creates bad hobbyists because I didn't. I grew up watching people free handle Steve Irwin free handle. Steve dude. Irwin. Yeah. yeah. We love, no, Steve Irwin doesn't catch any shit from anyone in this industry really uh, with any like kind of ground. And he was a free handler at the end of the day. That's what it, it's just the way it is. And so I don't think that it, and we don't have like this deluge of free handlers. Really? They're still isolatable, nameable people like, Oh, this guy free handles, this guy free handles, this guy free handles. But how many people were inspired by Steve who don't free handle? It's uncountable. There's just, just hundreds of thousands of people across the United States who were like super influenced by Steve, but they didn't take after the free handling practice, you know? So I don't think it necessarily like, Oh, you're free handling. So little Timmy's going to free handle when he gets older. I think if you were going to do it, you were going to do it. And while I don't condone it or recommend it to anybody, it's your body, it's your life, it's your animals. As long as you're not flicking them on the nose while you're doing it, you know, I, if you're not hurting them, then you're just taking a calculated risk. Not one that the math doesn't work out for me, but if the math works out for you, that's your life, dude. So I don't, I'm very kind of a blase, c'est la vie, sort of que sera, sera, whatever other cliche you want to throw in there kind of person about the whole situation. So, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's hard. I feel like you need to be wired that particular way. I mean, it takes a certain person to do that. Obviously we've seen it all happen. We haven't been. We've played video games too. We haven't murdered anyone yet. We watch horror exactly. movies, I'm sure. I mean, and and then again, like, yeah, if one of my friends was doing, I'd be like, it's not a good idea, dude. But if you want to do, I mean, I don't know. At this point, I'm I'm the same way, kind of. Right. I mean, it's. I think it's the most. I think it's the approach that makes the most sense. And I guess it's just because I'm very sort of like, uh, I'm very sort of like if you're not bothering me and you're not bothering other people, I'm not going to try to regulate what you do. Like that's basically my mentality. And I address that too. I, I, I carry that to a lot of different aspects of my life, including the way people handle their snakes. Like as long as the snake's not hurting and you're not throwing the venomous snake at people <laughs> that you see on the street, you know, I, it's, it's your, it's your deal. Do what you're going to do.
Yeah, so. exactly. So uh, we're winding down, man. We're coming up on two hours. So went by fast. You... I actually can't believe how fast two hours went by. I know it's wild. So you have right now. You just you started your first reptile store. You just got another one recently. What is the future of all this for you? Honestly, dude, I don't want to own any more reptile stores. That is not the future. That is not on the docket for Chance Chick in the future. Um, I will be happy with two. I think down the road, way, way, way down the road, I might pull a Jay Brewer and just like open a big facility. You know, like I might unify the two into a big building that I buy and make it sort of a, a reptarian, so to speak. Um, but with the emphasis still being on education, obviously, like a, but, but a big facility, you know, I'm talking like 5,000 square feet if I could. That would be cool. But if I did that sort of thing, I wouldn't want to have any other facilities. Everything else I do past that is going to be personal wildlife conservation education. Wildlife education, even more of an emphasis on. But I want to do research projects as well. So if I'm not doing something to spread the word, I want to be doing something to actually further research on an individual species or an individual habitat or something along those lines. I really want to get my feet wet too and expose other people who are doing it. You know, if I have a friend who's doing a really cool research project, I want the world to know that. And a lot of my friends who are in this industry are pretty timid, you know, like they're like, yeah, here I am working with my tiny species of field mouse or whatever that I'm studying. And it's just me and my field mouse. And they don't really want that. Like they, they might, they don't want a platform to speak from, but they do want their work to be acknowledged. And I would love to have uh, one of my dreams is like a big multimedia conglomerate that highlights people in this industry and the, and the field that are doing amazing research work. Like I want it to be a hub of like, Hey, what's going on in North central Florida? Who's studying sandhill crane habitats? Who's studying, you know, uh, coastal salamander habitats and, and, and who's, and who's doing the real work and, and what's getting done and, and how can you help them and how can you learn more? And I just, I want it to be so accessible and so out there. So that's my pipe dream. And I'm still just young enough to, to, to want to change the world. You know, you know how that is? Like, no one's you, beating you down yet. To yeah, exactly. submission. Life it's starting to, but life hasn't been <laughs> quite hard enough where I don't want to go, you know, change the world still. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like no one has really bridged the gap as far as, uh, as private keepers, I feel like it benefits us to join the fight in conservation and stuff like that. It only reflects positively against or for Absolutely, us. Or, so it's crusty. like, I feel like we need to join the fight, basically. Absolutely. Look at the crested gecko, man. Look at the crested gecko. Basically, what, functionally or extinct? They thought to be extinct until 1994, man. It's, it's, there, are, there are examples of where it's already worked, and it can absolutely work again. So... And at the very least, we can, we have the animals and therefore we can educate people about them. And just, just getting the word out there and showing people on the street an animal or putting it in a video or, you know, if you make a video about false, false water cobras, there's going to be more people appreciating false water cobras. And I think that's a positive. 100%. So if anyone wants to get in touch with you, where can they find you? Um, you can hit me up on either one of, you can either hit me up on the shop's Instagram page or my personal brand's Instagram page or on Facebook through the same avenues. Um, if you go to either one, either my brand's in Facebook page or my shop's Facebook page, if you DM any of those, you're not getting some receptionist, you know, you're not getting some agent, you're getting me. I'm not that big. So if you want to reach out to me, that you can, it's, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, my Instagram handle is at the backyard biologist. So at T H E B A C K Y A R D B I O L O G I S T. Did I just spell that right? Or did I I'll put that? it in the description. <laughs> yeah. It's spelled like the backyard biologist, all one word. Um, and then the shop's Instagram is at Gator city reptiles with an underscore in between the words. So Gator underscore city underscore reptiles. And then you can find us on Facebook too. So That'd be the, probably the most efficient way to reach out. Sweet. As for me, uh, Port City Pet, portcitypythons.com, all that good stuff, isopods. And uh, yeah, go out there and support some reptile business if you have the means to. I hope everyone is doing okay. And uh, yeah, stay, stay bored and batten down, but uh, keep an eye on your animals and have fun out there. Absolutely. All right, Chance. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we will catch everyone next week. All right, Joe. It was a pleasure, man.